novel title, when I tried strengthening Rusted Sword, it evolved into an overpowered Magic Sword Volume 01, completed by author, Mano Mizuki. Translated by Zephyr Audio Book. Source, https colon slash slash encode.sosita.com slash n1199gc slash Volume 01, completed. Chapter 01, Divine Artifact. Upon reaching the age of 12, Individuals receive a gift known as the Divine Artifact from the Gods. This artifact serves as a special weapon to combat demons and monsters. Those who wield these weapons to protect others from demons and monsters are revered as adventurers for their bravery. I've always admired adventurers like them. Now that I'm 12, I can finally take the first step towards becoming one. Today marks the beginning of my adventure to become a hero. Hey, Rast. You better wake up soon or you'll be late. M morning. I was awakened by the voice of a girl while still wrapped in my blanket. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I peeled back the covers to find myself locking eyes with a red-haired girl. Good morning, Rast. Today is the long-awaited blessing ceremony. Let's get ready and head to the temple. Ruby. My childhood friend, Ruby Blood. She gazed at me with amusement, wearing a bright smile as I struggled to wake up. Seriously, Rast. You were so excited about the blessing ceremony yesterday, but if you're late for the ritual, it'll be a disaster. So, hurry up and get ready. Um, yeah, sorry, Ruby. Apologizing, I sluggishly got out of bed. That's right, today is the day I receive the eagerly awaited blessing ceremony. Today, we officially become adults. And we will be bestowed with a divine artifact from the gods. There's no way I can afford to be late for the ceremony. Thanks for waking me up. I won't be late, thanks to you. But why do you always barge into my room? I've asked you to stop doing that before. Well, because Rast's mom told me to wake him up. Honestly, Ruby's house is right across from mine, and we've been playing together since we were kids. She often comes over to play, even entering my room without permission. I didn't mind when we were kids, but lately, I've been feeling a bit embarrassed about it. After all, we're already grown-ups. Even Rast's mom is looking forward to Rast's blessing ceremony. And yet, if Rast oversleeps until the last minute and misses the ceremony, what's going on? Were you so excited that you couldn't sleep last night? And no, it's not like that. If anything, it's the opposite. I'm excited, but at the same time, I'm a bit nervous. That's why I couldn't sleep well. Nervous? With a puzzled expression, Ruby tilted her head. Well, you see... I don't know what kind of divine artifact I'll receive, so I'm worried about what might happen if I get a weird one. Well, that's true. Since divine artifacts are weapons to protect against demons and monsters, it would be troublesome if you received a strange one. The ceremony only happens once, after all. Indeed, the blessing ceremony, where we receive a divine artifact, only happens once. There's no second chance. And since the divine artifact is a special weapon to fight demons and monsters, depending on what we receive, it could determine our future to some extent. It's no exaggeration to say that the blessing ceremony can shape our lives. Plus, we can only use our own divine artifact. With such an important ceremony approaching, there's no way I could have had a peaceful sleep. Well, unlike me, Ruby seems to have nerves of steel as she must have slept like a log. She even has enough spare time to come wake up her oversleeping childhood friend. Thinking so, as I ran my hand through my messy hair with a comb, Ruby wore a mischievous smile and said, Rast has always been timid since he was little. Because of that, he was always bullied by the boys in the village. It would be nice if receiving the ceremony would change that personality of his even a bit. Ugh. But, well, it's natural to feel nervous about the blessing ceremony. I feel the same way, you know. Because we, after all, question mark Ruby began, her gentle smile directed towards me as she continued, we made a promise to become adventurers together. If we receive strange divine artifacts, that dream won't come true, you know. Yeah, that's right. I returned a firm nod. Ruby and I made a promise to become adventurers together. This is our shared dream. We both aspire to become cool heroes like those depicted in adventure tales. Let's both hope we receive good artifacts from the gods. Last. Yeah. It would be nice if we both received good artifacts. If one of us gets an amazing artifact while the other gets a low ranking one, it would be awkward. It seems this concern isn't mine alone as Ruby blurted out something rather ominous. Well, 
if last ends up with a weird artifact and I get an amazing one, I might just leave you behind and become a master class adventurer first. Just kidding. Ugh. I'd prefer it if she didn't joke about that. It doesn't seem like a laughing matter to me. I don't want Ruby to succeed as an adventurer before me just because she got a stronger artifact. Well, even if I end up with a D or E rank ordinary artifact, making it difficult for me to become an adventurer, I won't give up on my dream. Even if I'm left behind by Ruby. I'll definitely become an adventurer. No matter how much time it takes. Once you've harbored aspirations, they're not easily let go. Alright, let's hurry up and get ready to go to the temple. I think everyone's already gathered. Yeah, that's right. Hey, I'm gonna change clothes now, so can you wait outside for a bit? Truth be old, I'd been thinking about changing for a while now, but Ruby didn't seem to be making any moves to leave. So, finally, I verbalized it. But Ruby responded with the same mischievous smile as before. I'm worried you'll oversleep again, so I'll keep watch here. Just leave already, you're going to make us late. We really might end up being late. Chapter Row 2, Ceremony of Blessings The Ceremony of Blessings takes place in the temple, where divine powers converge. Every town and village boasts at least one temple, and our home, Red Village is no exception. A magnificent temple stands proudly in our village. It's to this temple that Ruby and I have come. Wow, look at all the people. It's not just folks from Red Village, I remarked. The indoor space was already bustling with a crowd. Among them were unfamiliar faces, likely residents from other towns and villages. It seems like folks from other towns and villages have gathered to receive the ceremony too. Since this temple is the largest around here. They're probably conducting it all here. Remember what Mayor Beryl said yesterday? I turned to Ruby. Uh, did he? I couldn't recall, my nerves getting the best of me. Realizing there were many unfamiliar faces only added to the tension welling up inside me. Upon closer inspection, I noticed parents of those undergoing the blessing ceremony were also present. They must have come to witness their children's momentous occasion. My mother couldn't make it due to her busy schedule. Perhaps that's a blessing in disguise. At least there's no chance of embarrassing myself in front of her. Though I'll have to give her a thorough report later. Oh, look over there. Adventurers are here too, Ruby pointed out. Really? Sure enough, among the crowd were several adventurers presumably seeking promising talents to join their parties. They were probably looking to recruit those who had received high-ranked divine artifacts into their ranks. As we made our way deeper into the temple, amidst the gazes of such individuals, a voice called out to Ruby from somewhere. Oh, Ruby-chan, you're running late. The ceremony's about to begin. Hey, everyone. Sorry to keep you waiting. With a quick I'll be right back. Ruby left my side. She's quite popular. She has plenty of friends in Red Village and is acquainted with folks from other towns and villages as well. Her outgoing nature is the polar opposite of my own shyness. Left alone, I reluctantly found a corner to wait for the ceremony to commence. Just as I was about to retreat to the sidelines. Ouch. I collided with someone, or rather, they collided with me on purpose. Who could it be? Well, it's not hard to guess. Oh. If it isn't last, my bad, my bad, didn't notice you there, you're too short, said Elio. Elio Thor, with his eyes slightly slanted and golden hair sticking up, always picking on me. You could say he's the ringleader of the kids in Red Village. It seems he's here for the ceremony of blessings too. It's only natural since we're the same age. What are you doing here? last planning to receive some divine artifact like you'd ever be brave enough to fight demons even if you did get one is there even a point in you participating in this ceremony he jeered hey i chuckled awkwardly in response to his taunts i've always been on the receiving end of his meanness so i find it hard to deal with elio i can't muster the courage to retort even though i know i should those memories of past bullying flood my mind rendering me unable to stand up to him. As a result, I'm left with a feeble smile, silently enduring. However, just at that moment, oh, Elio, still bothering last, aren't you? Can't you give it a rest, even now? Ruby's timely return interrupted. Ugh, here comes the pest, Elio muttered under his breath. Ruby always steps in to rescue me from Elio and the other boys. Her sense of justice is unwavering and she despises bullying above all else. So she's always there to help me, and I, somewhere deep down, 
rely on her for that. With Elio deflated by her intervention, he turned his back on us and walked away. As I watched him leave, relief washed over me. Elio still scares me. Phew, that was close, I muttered, and Ruby nudged me in the side. It's not phew, last. You should have said something back. She scolded gently, sorry. We're turning 12 soon and becoming adults. We have to be stronger. You can't rely on me to protect you forever. You need to stand up for yourself, last. Yeah, you're right. It's truly pathetic. I can't keep relying on Ruby for protection. If I can't even fend off one or two bullies on my own, how can I ever hope to become the hero I dream of? Today, I'll change. I'll show them. As I silently made that resolve. The voice of the temple priest echoed through the hall. Now, let us begin the ceremony of blessing from this moment. Those receiving the ritual shall approach the altar. The bustling temple suddenly fell into a profound silence. Immediately, a young boy emerged from among the participants. All right, I'll go first. Following the instructions of the priest, the boy walked towards the altar. The altar, bathed in the sunlight streaming from the skylight, emitted a radiant white glow. It seemed that once a year, on a day when sacred light poured from the sun, one could converse with the gods only while it shone upon the altar. Only those aged 12 and above could engage in this dialogue. In other words, adults. In the past, people had no means to combat demons and monsters and were unilaterally oppressed. Demons possessed tough skin called demon armor, making it impossible to inflict even a scratch with ordinary weapons. Upon pleading with the gods for assistance, they were surprisingly able to engage in dialogue, receiving special weapons capable of defeating demons and monsters. This is said to be the origin of the ceremony of blessing. Well, whether it's a true story or not is unknown. Anyway, it's a fact that individuals aged 12 and above who offer prayers at the altar on the day of the white light receive weapons capable of defeating demons, and the boy followed suit clasping his hands before the altar. The altar then began to emit an even brighter light. Overwhelmed by the brightness, I involuntarily closed my eyes, and upon reopening them, a large axe had appeared on the altar. So, this is the ceremony of blessing. I couldn't help but widen my eyes in astonishment. Although I had witnessed the ceremony several times before, I couldn't suppress my amazement each time I saw this phenomenon. Moreover, being on the receiving end of the ceremony this time, the impact was even greater. As I watched the altar in astonishment, the boy joyfully picked up the divine instrument and exclaimed, Steel great axe. It's a C-rank divine instrument. Instantly, applause erupted from the surroundings. Equipping the divine instrument allows one to obtain detailed information, the properties, of it, name, rank and all the power residing within the divine instrument. Furthermore, it is customary for those who have undergone the ritual to publicly announce what divine instrument they have received. In accordance with this, the boy who announced the name and rank of the divine instrument joyfully stepped back. Next, it's my turn. The following girl offered her prayers, and the altar emitted a dazzling light. Taking the green short sword that appeared, the girl also raised her voice. Gale short sword. I also got a C rank. Once again, there was applause. The people around showed delighted reactions. This year might be a good harvest. Depending on a year, not even a single C rank divine instrument might appear. To think there would be two all of a sudden, it's even more exciting. Divine instruments are assigned ranks. Starting from A, B, C, D, E, F. The rank varies depending on the performance of the divine instrument. The average is a D rank divine instrument. Many people will receive such divine instruments. Among them, it is said that a C rank divine instrument is given to one out of a thousand people. A B rank divine instrument is given to one out of ten thousand people. A E rank divine instrument is given to one out of a hundred thousand people. Well, that's not certain. Anyway, following the outstanding performance of the young boys and girls, the ceremony of blessing proceeded smoothly. D rank, D rank, C rank, D rank. It seems that there are indeed many D rank divine instruments. It's even more remarkable that there are no divine instruments below D rank, so perhaps this year is indeed bountiful. And amidst all this, W what is that divine instrument? As I focused on the altar, there was clearly a long spear placed there that was distinctly different from the others, adorned with beautiful decorations. It emitted a powerful aura. Holding it proudly was none other than the bully, Elio. Thundering spear. It's a B rank. Instantly, 
the most enthusiastic applause of the day was sent his way. Oh! As expected of Elio, I knew you could do it. Let me have a good look too. The adults of the village, friends, and people from other villages all applauded Elio's ritual. A B rank divine instrument. It's truly impressive. Elio had always been strong in fights, and he had also mentioned that he aimed to become an adventurer like me and Ruby. With that divine instrument, he would surely become an amazing adventurer. Then, Adventurers who had been watching nearby began to approach Elio and talk to him. Do you have any interest in becoming an adventurer? Would you like to join our party? We'd also welcome you with open arms, young man. Let's become adventurers together and defeat the demons. The customary invitation to become an adventurer at the ceremony of blessing. To become an adventurer, one must take an exam and pass it. However, if invited by an existing adventurer party, one can become an adventurer without taking the exam. They call it a recommendation. I heard that only high-ranking adventurers can recommend others, so those people must be quite impressive adventurers too. How envious it is to receive so much attention from people like them. As I watch Elio Kun, I can't help but think that, suddenly, he looks in our direction. His cheeks loosen into a smirk. That smug look on his face is really irritating. Ah, ha ha ha. It's as if he's saying. See that? Ruby didn't seem to like it. Alright then, I'll show him by summoning an artifact that can rival his. Do your best, Ruby. In response to Elio Kun receiving a B rank artifact, Ruby also steps forward to the altar. She bows her head respectfully to the priest standing beside her and introduces herself politely. I'm Ruby Blood, pleased to meet you. Ruby clasps her hands together in front of the altar and offers a prayer to the gods. I can't imagine what she's thinking. But even from the sidelines, her seriousness is palpable. Then, the altar begins to emit a bright light. Somehow, it feels like the radiance of the altar is stronger than that of the other ceremonies. Eventually. When the light subsides, a large sword is placed on the altar. W what is that? A large sword dyed entirely in crimson, with a disproportionately thick blade for a girl to wield. Yet Ruby effortlessly lifts the sword and proudly declares the name and rank of the artifact. Um. Flame Dragon's Great Sword. A rank? For a moment, the temple falls into silence. Everyone is wide-eyed, gazing at Ruby. Soon, as the stunt crowd snaps out of it, Cheers erupt throughout the temple. W wow, a knee rank artifact. This is the first time I've seen one up close. It's incredibly beautiful. Ruby herself seems to have not immediately realized the greatness of her artifact. When she finally notices the splendor of her own artifact, she looks towards me while brandishing it. A look, last. I have a knee rank artifact. It's the strongest one. T that's amazing. Ruby. She truly received an artifact that rivals Elio Kun's. Ruby is amazing indeed. With her strong sense of justice, cool demeanor, and talent for becoming an adventurer, as a childhood friend, I'm incredibly happy for her. As I silently revel in joy, adventurers begin to flock to Ruby. Encountering an E rank artifact is a rare occurrence indeed. It's inevitable that she would attract recruitment offers. Ruby is overwhelmed by the numerous offers. In the midst of it all, a woman emerges from the crowd, with hair as white as light, reaching down to her waist, and equally fair skin, she has a perfect visage. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to call her a beauty. The woman effortlessly parts the crowd of adventurers and stands before Ruby. H hey, isn't that? Yeah, you're right. It's Hero Party. Her name rings a bell for me too. The title bestowed upon the strongest adventurer, the hero. And currently, the one held as the strongest adventurer is a female adventurer named Party Lightning. Commonly known as Hero Party. Is that really her? But what could she possibly want with Ruby? If you don't mind, would you like to join my party, Ruby Blood? A. The surprise wasn't exclusive to Ruby. I, along with those around us, held our breath in unison. A. Are you being invited to the Hero's Party? I. It's amazing, Ruby. You should definitely join. Amidst the surrounding commotion, the Hero. Parody, frowned. It's too noisy to talk here. Let's discuss the details over there, Ruby Blood. I is it okay if it's me? Even if I were to join that hero's party. Are there any other participants named Ruby Blood besides you? Just come along. Why yes. Upon being told so, Ruby happily followed behind the hero. But just before disappearing from sight, she abruptly stopped. Then, she glanced in my direction and clenched her fist tightly as if to say, Keep going till the end. That's how it appeared to me. Afterward, 
Ruby followed Parody into the crowd and vanished. All I could do was stare in astonishment at her retreating figure. S so amazing, Ruby. To be invited by the legendary hero, Parody Lightning. In that case, I couldn't help but have my own aspirations. I want a relic like that too. I won't ask for a knee rank luxury. Just a relic powerful enough to fight against demons. And then, being invited to some party, I want to become an adventurer with Ruby. With determination, I walk toward the altar. You're the last one. Yes, I am last stone. After exchanging greetings with a priest, I too began preparations for the ceremony. I clasped my hands in front of the altar and offered a prayer to the gods. It seems you can pray for anything. But what I'm asking for is decided. God, please grant me power. Power to fight alongside Ruby. Power not to lose to Elio. Power to become a hero. Please, God. In an instant, a dazzling light emanated from the altar. A strong light comparable to Ruby's ceremony from earlier. Inevitably, both my expectations and those of the people around me swelled. Gradually, the light subsided, revealing a single sword on the altar. Everyone's excited gaze focused on that sword. T this is. My eyes widened in surprise. The people around me also stared at the altar with astonished expressions. Because atop the altar lay something entirely unexpected. How should I even begin to accept this reality? Could it be a mistake? To confirm, I grasped the handle of the relic. However. There was no mistake about the visible reality. Even though I tried to say the name and rank of the bestowed relic like everyone else, I couldn't utter a word. Because the relic I held in my hand was Name Rusty Sword Rank F Level 1 Attack Power 1 Blessings Strength plus 0 Endurance plus 0 Agility plus 0 Magic plus 0 Vitality plus 0 Skills Endurance 10 tenths. It was a dilapidated rusty sword that seemed on the brink of decay at any moment. Chapter 03, The Rusty Blade View. Someone let out a laughter as if they couldn't contain it anymore. Ha ha ha. What's with that, last? Pulling out such a filthy, rusty sword as your last draw. Clearly the lowest of the low, an F-rank artifact. Ah, it hurts my stomach. Elio's laughter, like that, lured smiles from those around him. In the midst of so many high-quality artifacts being continuously drawn, the expectation around was high, yet here was this battered sword. It was understandable to burst into laughter. If I weren't directly involved, I might have laughed too. But I was unmistakably involved, and of course, it couldn't be laughed off. I glanced once more at the artifact bestowed upon me. Name, Rusty Blade. Rank, F. Level, 1. Attack Power, 1. Benefits, Strength plus 0, Endurance plus 0, Agility plus 0. Magic plus zero, vitality plus zero, skills, none, durability, ten tenths, rusted from tip to hilt, a sword that seems incapable of cutting through even a single demon, no, calling it a sword might be generous, it's more like scrap metal, one might believe it was picked up from some trash bin, naturally, its rank was F, the weakest of artifacts, no magic, no skills. All the benefits bestowed upon the wielder of artifacts were zero. Even possessing such an item wouldn't make one the slightest bit stronger. My blessing ceremony had utterly failed. Ah, that was quite amusing. Thanks for the good punchline, last. Alright, let's go, everyone. As it was my last draw, when Elio said so, everyone left the temple. Naturally, not a single adventurer approached me. No one was interested in me anymore. Exclamation mark. I instinctively fled from the scene. Ah, last. Just then, I passed by Ruby as she returned to the temple. But I didn't stop, distancing myself from Ruby. I ran through the village, ending up near the forest, yet I continued running to distract myself from my frustration. Damn it, damn it, damn it. I wanted to become an adventurer. I wanted to become a hero. But that was no longer possible. The sword gripped in my right hand told the story more than anything else. I've never heard of anyone becoming an adventurer with an F-rank artifact. Even fighting monsters with an E-rank artifact is considered difficult, let alone becoming a hero with such a sword. It's a pipe dream. I was doomed to be someone protected for life. Ha. 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 Eventually, when I reached the heart of the forest, I stopped, panting heavily. After a while, when I looked up, I noticed a woman standing before me, considerably delayed. Ah, her hair, shining white, reaching down to her waist. Translucent, 
snow white skin perfect features it's the hero parody she's on a horse that seems to have been tied to the forest about to leave probably because she found a promising candidate ruby she's going back to a big town as our eyes met i thought i should say something like please take care of ruby but words failed me and i fell silent instead she spoke first you're ruby blood's childhood friend right huh why would she know that when i talked about recruitment i heard that you two pledged to become adventurers together if you're willing last stone would you join our party as well ruby so parody had asked for that we did promise to become adventurers together but she doesn't need to go to such lengths and besides i ended up with the weakest efrane artifact as i dropped my guard once again Parody continued her words. It could have been considered depending on the outcome of the ceremony, but it seems you didn't have the potential after all. A. You can't become an adventurer. If you push yourself, you'll surely become prey to demons and monsters. The hero looked at my right hand's rusty sword and said so bluntly. Being told such words by the admired adventurer, I felt a shock akin to being punched in the head. I can't become an adventurer. Pushing myself would only make me fodder for demons and monsters. Due to our past friendship, Ruby Blood will probably offer you words of encouragement. However, I believe it would be cruel of me to instill false hope. Therefore, allow me to convey this in Ruby Blood's place. It is best for you to accept this reality gracefully. There are plenty of other paths to take, the hero party declared. Indeed, certainly. What this person says is true. I cannot become an adventurer. It is diligent to search for another path. Pushing myself would only lead to a dog's death. And the expectation that Ruby would encourage me is mostly correct. In place of Ruby, this man, the hero Parlty, coldly asserted to me that I cannot become an adventurer. Afterward, hero Parlty rode his horse and disappeared into the depths of the forest. Left behind, I continued to sit powerlessly on the ground. Then. Eventually, a familiar voice reached my ears from somewhere. Ah, last. It was Ruby's voice. Glancing in that direction, I saw a girl running towards me, her long red hair swaying. I was so worried wondering where you went. What are you doing here? In nothing. I said nothing. About meeting Hero Parlty here. And about what was said here. As I fell silent, Ruby awkwardly inquired. You um, last, what was the sacred artifact like? I wasn't there at the ceremony so I didn't get to see it. What was it like? As anyone could see, I raised my worn-out sword with no spirit and said in a flat voice, it's an F-ranked sacred artifact. It has no skills, no magic, no blessings, just a rusty sword. I I see. The atmosphere became awkward. It turned out just as I had said before the ceremony. Ruby is A-ranked. I am F-ranked. The strongest and the weakest. Ruby was invited by the strongest adventurers while I went unnoticed by anyone's eyes. Having promised to become adventurers together, this situation is truly pitiful. As I remained speechless, Ruby uttered words I couldn't ignore. T the result of the ceremony may have been disappointing, but it doesn't mean you can't become an adventurer, right? If you try hard, you can definitely become one. Last, you're a patient boy, and if you want, I'll help you too. Help? Is she saying she'll help me become an adventurer? That means she is willing to spend time for me until I become strong enough to be an adventurer. Then what about the invitation from that hero? It's obvious. If Ruby is kind and caring, she will refuse the invitation for my sake. Even though she was invited by the most powerful party, she'll be held back because of me. That's absolutely unacceptable. I won't allow it. I'll go ahead and wait for you. A. I wasn't invited to join any party, but I'll surely become strong, pass the adventurer's exam on my own. Someday, I'll gather comrades strong enough to not lose to the hero's party and catch up to you, Ruby. So, go ahead, and wait for me. Last, feeling that words alone wouldn't suffice. I pleaded with my eyes. Please don't worry about me. Please go ahead. I'll be fine alone. Above all, please don't embarrass me any further. I do have some pride. And I haven't given up. I was laughed at by Elio, denied my dream by the hero, and pitied by Ruby. Even so, I haven't given up on becoming an adventurer. On the contrary, I'm more determined than ever. No matter how long it takes, I'll become an adventurer. A hero. If. If that's what last says. Okay, 
I'll go ahead and wait for you. But you have to promise me to work hard to become an adventurer, to catch up to me. That's our next promise. Yeah, a promise. We couldn't fulfill the promise of becoming adventurers together. But we made another promise. I'll definitely catch up to Ruby. The next day, Ruby, in her aspiration to become an adventurer, left Red Village behind. Volume 01 Chapter 04 the first battle. Wah. Wow. Three days had passed since Ruby left the village. It seemed as though everything around me had become quieter in just that time. Without the usual nuisance of being awakened, mornings felt unexpectedly somber. But it wasn't just Ruby, other people our age were also lured into adventuring and promptly left the village. Perhaps because of that, the entire village now felt strangely silent. Good morning, last. M. Morning, Mom. As I descended to the first floor, I found my mother cleaning the house. I made my way to the kitchen, trying not to get in the way of her cleaning. Pouring water into a glass and sitting at the table, I drank some to clear my sleepy head. While sipping water, I absentmindedly watched my mother cleaning. Come to think of it, what did my mother think about the outcome of my blessing ceremony? When I told her I received an F rank artifact, she just said, I see and left it at that. She hadn't said anything more about it since then. Maybe she could tell how truly disheartened I was just from my expression and tone. I tried to hide my feelings as much as possible, but it seems my mother noticed anyway. By the way, last, you've been cooped up in your room a lot lately. Are you okay? Huh? Why yeah, I'm fine. Taken aback by the sudden question, I stuttered. Come to think of it. I had been spending most of my time in my room since the blessing ceremony. There had just been too much going on, and I felt drained. Before I could come up with an excuse, my mother made a completely wrong assumption. Are you feeling lonely because Ruby Chen is gone? Ruby? Well, we've been together since as long as I can remember, so I guess I do feel a little lonely because of that. But it's not like that's the reason I've been holed up in my room. Even though you're feeling lonely without your beloved Ruby Chan, you should get some sunlight. It'll do you good. I it's not like I love her or anything. I hastily denied it. It's true that I felt lonely without Ruby, but it wasn't the reason I was shutting myself away. I had been thinking things over by myself. What I needed to do to become an adventurer. Especially after revealing the F rank artifact, becoming an adventurer's had become incredibly difficult. I needed to think carefully about my next steps. And then, oh, by the way, Mom, what is it? I've been thinking about getting a job in the village soon. Do you know of any good ones? People who underwent the blessing ceremony were treated as adults afterwards. In other words, they had to find some kind of work. I had been considering what kind of work to do. Especially since my father had died of illness before I could remember, leaving my mother to raise me alone. It was about time I got a job. At the same time, I knew aiming to become an adventurer would be tough. But I was determined not to give up. As I secretly made that determination, my mother unexpectedly responded. Oh, there's nothing like that. Huh? After all, last, you want to become an adventurer, don't you? Uh, yeah. But, in that case, don't you have something to do for that? You don't have time for a job, do you? Exclamation mark. As if it were the most obvious thing in the world. She said that leaving me speechless. What I had to do was training. You could strengthen the artifact you received by fighting demons. According to one theory, fighting demons would bless you from the gods and strengthen your artifact. I didn't know if that theory was true, but adventurers did indeed raise the level of their artifacts through battles with demons. Especially since I had received the lowest ranked artifact, I would have to experience more battles and become stronger than anyone else. If I didn't drain even while working, my dream of becoming an adventurer wouldn't come true. That's why I had been holed up in my room, thinking about how to balance work and training. But would my mother allow me to prioritize training over work? Would she give me a chance? As I agonized over it, my mother gave me one last push. I've made a lunchbox for you. Take it and do your best. Mom. My eyes welled up with warmth. I thought no one would support me and there was almost no chance. Trying to become an adventurer with an F rank artifact was just a pipe dream. But thanks to my mother, my heart was saved. I immediately packed the lunchbox into a cloth bag, slung the rusty sword over my back, and put on my shoes. Thanks, Mom. Well then, I'm off. Yeah? Take care. I dashed out of the house. Even someone like me has people who believe in me. My mother, who pushed me forward. Ruby, 
who said she'd wait for me. I may not have been blessed at the blessing ceremony, but I've been blessed with encounters with people. Thinking happily about it, I smiled and continued to run. Eventually, I reached the forest nearby after leaving the village. Huh. The whispering woods. The rustling of leaves and grasses swayed by the wind created a hushed atmosphere, akin to the murmurings of gossip. It was said since childhood to stay away from the depths of this forest, as it was rumored to be inhabited by monsters. If memory served, the name of these creatures was treants. They were creatures shaped like trees, known to attack anyone who crossed their path. With vine-like limbs, they would entangle their victims, draining them of their life force. It seemed that human life force was their favorite meal, their primary source of sustenance. While they sounded terrifying, in reality, their combat abilities were not that formidable. They didn't employ any special attacks, they merely used their elongated vine-like arms to strike. Thus, they were classified as weak monsters. They seemed like suitable opponents for my training. With that in mind, I ventured deeper into the whispering woods. There it is. Sure enough, I spotted a treant. Its thick, root-like legs moved rhythmically as it roamed through the forest. Conveniently, it seemed to be alone. Seeing the creature again sent a shiver down my spine. But there was no room for hesitation. I firmly gripped the rusted sword strapped to my back with my right hand and slowly drew it out. Before engaging, I checked the details of my weapon. The rusted sword. Name. Rusted sword. Rank. F. Level. 1. Attack power. 1. Bonuses. Strength plus 0. Endurance plus 0. Agility plus 0. Magic plus 0. Vitality plus 0. Skills. None. Durability. 10 tenths. A mere rusted sword with no magical properties, skills, or bonuses. Quite unreliable, but it would have to do for now. At least it had an attack power of 1. The demons possessed a tough skin called demon armor. Ordinary weapons couldn't scratch it, but weapons imbued with sacred power could penetrate it. Therefore, even with this feeble attack power of 1, the rusted sword theoretically could defeat the monster. So, I'll be fine. I reassured myself and tightened my grip on the sword's hilt. Just then, the treant noticed me and began to approach moving its root like legs. Gijijig. It's coming. The treant swung its vine like arms like whips. I instinctively dodged. Seeing the treant's vulnerable body in front of me, I swung my sword recklessly. Ha! I struck the treant's body with the rusted sword. Or rather, I should say I hit it. A dull thud echoed, far from the sound of a successful strike, and the treant staggered backward lightly. Gijig. It worked. Though I didn't cut it, the blow from the rusted sword with attack power did some damage. This gave me hope. But before I could relish it, the treant swung its vines again, faster and with more anger. It seemed provoked by my attack. This time, it aimed slightly lower, making it harder for me to dodge while crouching. Coo. The vines whipped like lashes, and I couldn't block them with my sword. Helplessly, I was struck by the vines, sending me flying backward crashing into a nearby tree. Ouch. I couldn't help but gasp. It hurt. A lot. I hurt all over. I was nearly knocked unconscious by that one blow. This was what it meant to fight. The tension of facing death for the first time. Despite being classified as weak, these monsters were formidable. Moreover, without any bonuses bestowed upon me, my current physical abilities were no different from those of a feeble 12-year-old boy. Name. Rusted Sword. Rank. F. Level. 1. Attack power, 1. Bonuses, strength plus 0, endurance plus 0, agility plus 0, magic plus 0, vitality plus 0, skills, none. Durability, 10 tenths. A. Within artifacts lies a special power called blessings. These blessings enhance various aspects such as the strength and endurance of the wielder, allowing skilled adventurers to perform superhuman feats. They are deemed more crucial than magic or skills. For D-rank artifacts between levels 10 to 20, the average values are around 100. With such attributes, one can attain extraordinary physical abilities, and it is said that surpassing a value of 300 grants transcendent power beyond human comprehension. However, the rusty sword possesses none of these blessings. Its blessings are all zero. Incidentally, the same applies to its attack power. The average attack power is around 100. If it exceeds 300, it can defeat most demons, and if it surpasses 500, it is considered a legendary artifact that will be remembered in history. For reference, the artifact wielded by the Guard of Red Village, 
who once served as a mid-tier adventurer, is as follows, name, heavy bone hand aches, rank, C, level, 20, attack power, 150, blessings, strength plus 170, endurance plus 120, agility plus 80, magic plus 0, vitality plus 150, skill, strength enhancement, endurance, 200 200, out of curiosity, I once asked about the properties of artifacts, and I was kindly taught, with properties like these, one can significantly excel as an adventurer, according to rumors, the artifact of the previous hero apparently had an attack power exceeding 600, making it the artifact with the highest confirmed attack power to date, its name is the heavenly sword, in any case, I now understand just how weak my artifact is, fighting like this without blessings is quite difficult, but I have no choice but to do it, I stand up and tightly grip the rusty sword, in contrast, Trent extends its tendrils, aiming to entangle me, I instinctively move behind a large tree, its tendrils get caught on the branches of the tree, entwining nicely, alright, I'm saved by chance, in that moment, I close in on Trent, slipping past its side, I strike its defenseless back with a rusty sword, ha, one strike, two strikes, three strikes, I relentlessly continue slashing, yura ah, uh, with all my strength, I swing the rusty sword at Trent's immobilized back, just as my hands start to numb, I finally see a change in Trent, gijig, Trent falls to the ground weakly, and everything becomes silent, as I watch in wonder, Trent's body begins to emit a faint light, in an instant, its entire body turns into fine particles of light and disappears, did. Did I win? I stare at the ground where Trent vanished. This phenomenon of demons disappearing upon defeat. I heard that when a demon's vitality is depleted, it turns into light and disappears. Which means, I defeated Trent, with the weakest trusty sword. Phew, I'm exhausted, feeling relieved by my victory. I sit down on the ground as if collapsing. I take out a small flask of water from the cloth bag tied to my waist and take a sip to refresh myself. It's quite tough after all. I thought I could fight reasonably well if I had attack power, but struggling so much against just one trend is no good. It's impossible to pass the rigorous adventurer exam said to be difficult. I guess I'll have to defeat demons steadily and gradually strengthen the rusty sword. By the way. Has the level of the artifact increased? Thinking about it, I check the properties of the rusty sword. Name, rusty sword. Rank, F. Level, 1. Attack power, 1. Blessings, strength plus 0. Endurance plus 0. Agility plus 0. Magic plus 0. Vitality plus 0. Skill, none. Endurance, 6 tenths. Ga. The endurance has already decreased this much. I inadvertently raise my voice. I had a vague sense that the level hadn't increased, but I didn't expect the endurance to have decreased by nearly half already. At this rate, I can probably only fight one more time. After defeating the next trend, I should go to the temple to replenish the endurance. At the temple, you can restore the endurance of artifacts. Additionally, you can also repair artifacts that have been completely damaged and broken. By placing the artifact or part of it on the altar and offering prayers, the gods will restore it to its original state. If an artifact is broken, all its effects are nullified, so it's better to fix it before it breaks. Since the attack power, blessings, magic, and skills will all cease to function, you won't be able to fight demons anymore. At this rate, I'll probably have to rely on the temple a lot from now on. And it's inefficient. It's really reckless to fight with this rusty sword after all. But I'm not incapable of fighting. There are indeed ways to become stronger. My mother is pushing me forward, and I'll slowly but surely become stronger. Besides, everything is a test. I gaze at the rusty sword gripped in my right hand and renew my determination. From then on, I continued the days of hunting turns deep in the forest. Rain or shine. Carrying my mother's bento and the rusty sword, I sneak into the secretive forest. There were days when I returned home in tears after being defeated and days when the endurance was completely depleted, breaking the artifact. Yet, I continued my training to become the adventurer I admire, to meet my mother's expectations, to catch up to Ruby. With each passing day, I didn't realize that three years had already gone by. Even now, I struggle greatly to defeat just one Trent and my abilities haven't changed since three years ago. Volume 01 Chapter 05 Three years later. Phew, I think that's enough for today. Having defeated the third trend of the day, 
I sheathed my sword and began walking towards the exit of the forest to return to the village. It's been three years since I underwent the blessing ceremony. I've been living days like these ever since. Even now, my abilities haven't changed since three years ago. Not just my own strength, but more importantly, there hasn't been the slightest change in my sacred weapon either. Name, Rusty Blade. Rank, F. Level, 9. Attack Power, 9. Attributes, Strength plus 0. Endurance plus zero, agility plus zero, magic plus zero, vitality plus zero, skills, endurance, 1015. This is the current property of my rusty blade. Since receiving it during the ceremony, its level has risen to nine. Along with that, its attack power has increased, but it still lacks any magic or skills. All its attributes remain at zero. Has it become just slightly easier to defeat Trents? That's about the extent of the subtle changes I've noticed. That's my achievement over these past three years. Sigh. Naturally, I find myself sighing more often. When I first started training, I approached everything with a positive mindset, thinking, everything's a test. But lately, to be honest, I've become pessimistic more often. Is there really any point in continuing like this? I'm not borrowing the words of that hero, but maybe I just don't have the talent. And so, I can't muster the same determination to train as before. I managed to raise the level of my sacred weapon to 9 a year ago, but it hasn't increased at all since then. It's as if Rusty Blade has reached its limit. And on top of that, a certain rumor is putting even more breaks on my heart. The hero's right arm. Ruby Blood. Having left Red Village three years ago, Ruby has risen to prominence in the Heroes Party. Showing as much prowess as other prominent members, she's heard to have raised her adventurer class to platinum in just three years. Adventurers have a class based ranking system, with bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and master from the bottom up. Platinum is the second highest. It's the ultimate proof that she's already first class as an adventurer. Moreover, Ruby is still only 15 years old, known as the youngest adventurer girl to reach platinum. She's even been dubbed the Flame Swordsman recently, solidifying her position as the hero's right hand in the eyes of the public. She'll surely go down in history as a formidable female adventurer. She's gone so far already. Unconsciously, I look up at the blue sky, thinking of my childhood friend. The promise we made to become adventurers together now seems like a dream. I promise to catch up to her but the gap has widened before I knew it. I'm already. Hey, look at him. Just as I'm feeling dejected as usual, a male voice comes from somewhere unexpectedly. Glancing over, I see two young men wielding axes. Weren't they brothers who worked as lumberjacks in this forest? I've heard they use sacred weapons bestowed upon them in the blessing ceremony for their lumbering work. So, we sometimes cross paths when I'm training in the forest. Well, we've never really talked. He's still at it. Huh? Doesn't he realize it's pointless already? It seems they know about me just as much as I know about them. Three years ago, the only one from the bountiful generation who received an F rank sacred weapon and still aiming to become an adventurer with that rusty blade. From an outsider's perspective, it must seem utterly ridiculous. I understand their contempt. If our positions were reversed, I'd probably think I was wasting my time too. I silently clench my fist and grit my teeth out of frustration. Then, as if to escape from the lumberjack brothers, I start running in the opposite direction. Damn it, damn it, damn it. I know better than anyone that it's all futile. I've already despaired countless times, even without being told that it's pointless. I have no talent, no potential, no strength. Becoming an adventurer. Hey, big brother. Question mark suddenly. A girl's voice sounded nearby, causing me to instinctively stop in my tracks. Turning my gaze, I saw a girl from the Red Village standing there. She's someone I often see around the forest. Every time we meet on my way back from training, we exchange light greetings. Or rather, it seems like I've unconsciously made it all the way to the exit of the forest. You dropped this, big brother. Huh? The girl held out a bento box. It's the lunch box I always get from my mom. I must not have realized I dropped it since I was running away from the woodcutter brothers in a panic. Thanks for picking it up for me. Yeah, no problem at all. Taking the lunch box from the girl, I stored it in the cloth bag tied around my waist. I was about to leave from in front of her when, big brother, 
What do you usually do in the forest? I found myself questioned as if being held back. Since the wounds I received from the woodcutter brothers haven't fully healed yet, I really want to hurry home and recuperate. But I can't just ignore the innocent girl's question and leave. I pushed aside my downcast feelings for the time being and gave a non-committal answer. It's work. I'm a hunter who takes down monsters appearing around here. Wow, really? It feels somewhat guilty. Truth is, I haven't earned a single penny. I'm still unemployed, continuing my training with my mom taking care of me. I could have honestly admitted that, but some strange pride got in the way. Not that it's a return favor, but since it was a good opportunity, I decided to ask the girl something I was curious about too. By the way, what are you doing here? I often see you around this area. The girl brightened up with a radiant smile. I'm playing hide and seek with my friends. They can never find me over here. I haven't told anyone else. Really now? It's because there's Trent over here. It's dangerous, so children are told not to come near. Knowing the reason again, I decided to play the big brother role and give her a little advice. This area is a bit dangerous so I think it's better to play a bit closer to the village. Behind Mayor Barrel's house, it's pretty easy to hide and hard to find. Wow, really? Okay, I'll do that. The girl showed her smile again and waved her hand as she left. I used to play hide and seek a lot with kids of the same age when I was little. But I was just invited to join them. Everything was fresh back then, and everything I saw looked beautiful. I earnestly admired heroes, dreamed of becoming an adventurer with my childhood friend and often played pretend. I'm sure back then, just like that girl, I had a sparkling smile too. Now I'm filled with despair for the future, just sighing and looking worn out. What is it? It feels somehow regrettable to just go back like this. If I go back now, it feels like I'm denying even the memories of my childhood. Back then, my admiration for adventurers was genuine. Seeing the innocent smile of the girl, I could recall a little bit of that passion. And above all, being insulted by the woodcutter brothers. That's infuriating. I'll keep at it a little longer. I turn my gaze back to the forest, drawing the rusty sword hanging from my back. Then, in search of Trent, I ran deeper into the forest. It might be futile. Maybe I don't have the talent. But, everything's worth a try. Reminding myself of that, I continued hunting Trent until the sun went down. The dimly lit path home grew darker as evening descended. Reflecting on today's accomplishments, I hasten my way back. Five trends subdued, if one counts achievements. Considering the time spent until dusk, the tally of vanquished beasts was rather meager. Since parting ways with the girl, I had managed to defeat only two. Today seemed an anomaly with fewer trends prowling the woods. Moreover, the whispering woods appeared unusually quiet, stirring a sense of unease within me. Perhaps it was just my imagination. With these thoughts, I quickened my pace towards the forest's edge. Being late would only earn me a scolding from mother, best to return as swiftly as possible. And then, it happened. Screams. What? A sudden shriek pierced through the forest. That was the girl's voice from earlier. Hadn't she made her way back to the village? Didn't I warn her to steer clear of the woods for safety? But such thoughts were inconsequential now. That scream meant something had happened to her. Without a second thought. I dashed toward the source of the cry. Dodging through the trees, I soon reached an open clearing. There stood the girl from before, cornered by another figure I didn't recognize. That's, though human in base form, this figure bore features reminiscent of a demon. Jet black fur bristled like that of a wolf. Eyes sharp enough to instill fear with just a glance. Wicked fangs and claws. A being akin to a werewolf, if one were to make an analogy. And in its right hand, it wielded a jagged, obsidian sword. A mao, a mao, a higher ranking demon possessing intelligence unlike mere monsters. Aggressive, cunning, relishing in the act of killing above all else. Rumor had it that mao, upon surviving twelve years, received a divine artifact from a malevolent deity, not the benevolent gods who watched over us, but from a malevolent demon god. Likely, that black great sword was such an artifact. Blessed by the demon god. Ma received such ominous artifacts and used them to prey upon people. What such a Mao was doing in this place, I couldn't fathom. No, now wasn't the time for such thoughts. I had to save that girl. Just then, someone approached from behind me. Th that. 
Is that a Mao? Hey, are you kidding me? Why would one be near a rural village like this? It was the lumberjack brothers I had seen earlier in the day. They must have been working in the woods until this hour and heard the girls' cries. But upon seeing the menacing Mao before them, the two young men visibly trembled with fear. Their hands holding the axes shook, their faces contorted in terror. Because of that, they promptly turned on their heels to flee. Instinctively, I grabbed one of them by the sleeve. W where are you going? What do you mean, where? We need to get out of here fast. Can't you see that Mao? Indeed, I could see the Mao. But, but we have to help that girl. Is this really the time to be saying that? We're no match for that Mao. We need to summon the village guards as top priority. One of the lumberjacks yelled, but I couldn't agree and continued to hold onto his sleeve. While they dallied, the girl would surely meet a grim fate. Besides, Weren't the axes they held supposed to be divine artifacts for fighting demons? Surely, they were more potent than my rusty sword. Even if we couldn't match the Mao, we could at least stall it. By standing up to the Mao now, we might be able to save the girl. Let go already. Ah, he forcefully pulled away from my grip. And just like that, the lumberjack brothers bolted from the scene. Left alone, I found myself staring around, dazed and lost. S someone. Someone? Please help that girl. Someone, save her from the clutches of that Mel. Hurry, or she'll be killed by that Mel. Someone. Anyone. Not just someone. There's only me here. I'm the only one who can save her. What's the point of having a divine artifact in my right hand? How can I call myself an adventurer if I can't fight now? Don't rely on others. Rely only on your own strength. Even with my rusty sword, I can still fight. What I need is not a powerful divine artifact. Just the courage to confront my fear. So, move, move, move. Wah. With a cry that sounded pathetic even to myself. I charged at the Mao. Volume 01 Chapter Row 6, Evolution. A simple upward slash, devoid of any particular form or style. Since my artifact offers no advantage, it's likely that my sword appears to halt from their perspective. Regardless, I heave the rusted sword overhead with all my might. What? Who the hell are you? The demon, upon my entry into the plaza, finally notices me and casts a languid glance my way. Ignoring their reaction. I press forward with my strike, but just as I'm about to close in on the demon, my vision suddenly blurs. Then, a sharp pain shoots through my abdomen, and before I realize it, I'm sent flying backward towards a large tree. Ugh, it hurts. It hurts so much. I can't make sense of what just happened. Amidst the haze in my mind, I manage to lift my head and glance towards the demon, who has raised their right leg towards me. Did they kick me? What's with you? You're weak as hell. I thought someone coming at me so boldly might put up a fight, but you're a total letdown. The demon regards me with contempt. Admittedly, I'm among the weaker humans, but that kick was just too fast. I could barely see anything. Their combat prowess far surpasses mine, incomparable even to Trent, with whom I often spar. Presumably. They're benefiting from a potent boon from the artifact clutched in their right hand. Combining their already heightened physical abilities with the additional blessings from the artifact makes them an overwhelming force. This is a demon, an upper tier member of the beings adventurers contend fault with. While they're hardly a beatable opponent, I struggle to rise against my protesting body, still managing to wield my own artifact despite the dizziness. Step away from her. Huh? Step away? Well, then try and make me, you weakling. Their tone tinged with provocation. Enraged, I grip my artifact once more, launching into a second assault. Ha! Yet again, they. Ha! Pathetic. Utter while delivering a swift kick with their right leg, sending me reeling and crashing into the nearby tree. There's no time to evade or defend. The gap in our abilities is insurmountable. I collapse to the ground, unable to rise immediately. TCH. Facing such a weakling won't turn me much experience points. I heard there were skilled fighters born in the village nearby, so I came expecting more, but you're a huge disappointment. So, that's why this demon ventured near the Red Village. Three years ago, during the blessing ceremony, Ruby and numerous others received high tier artifacts. Most of them became adventurers, earning fame in their own right. Upon hearing these rumors, the demon sought strong fighters in the Red Village. Their artifact, blessed by a malevolent deity to the point of slaying powerful humans, only grows stronger with each victory. Though it's risky, 
I might as well target adventurers like Platinum or Master from now on. It's a quicker path to strength. The wolf demon speaks before walking towards the girl collapsed on the ground, raising their massive sword in their right hand. Well, enough talk. Experience points are experience points. Let's start with you, you little runt. And no, this is bad, that girl. Despite the pain coursing through my entire body, I hastily rise from the ground. You want? I recklessly interpose myself between the girl and the demon. Using my rusty sword, I manage to deflect the massive sword aimed at the girl, engaging the demon in a standoff. Ugh, huh? You managed to block that with such a battered artifact. I'll give credit where it's due, but instantly, their grip tightens on the hilt, and they whisper to me with chilling intensity. I'm getting annoyed, so I might just kill you for real now. In an instant, the hand holding the hilt pushes with incredible force. Their strength is unimaginable. My rusty sword stands no chance against their black great sword. At this rate, my artifact will shatter. Once it breaks, I'll have no means to fight. No, even before that, I'll be killed. Both me and the girl behind me. The durability of my rusty sword is. Name, rusty sword. Rank, F. Level, 9. Attack power, 9. Benefits, strength plus 0. Endurance plus zero, agility plus zero, magic plus zero, vitality plus zero, skills, endurance points, 215. Damn it, it wouldn't be strange for it to break right now. But I can't afford to lose. Can I not even defeat a single demon? Can I not even save a single girl? Even though I've trained so hard to become an adventurer. Even though Ruby and Mom pushed me forward so much. What were my three years even for? Well then. You wanna be hero. With a sinister grin, the wolf demon pushed the large sword further. A displeasing sound emanated from the rusty sword, and finally, it started to crack. Torn apart by his artifact, that's how it ends. Dash, a wannabe hero. I thought if I worked hard, I would eventually be rewarded. I thought something would change if I kept at it relentlessly. Though no one was watching, I thought someone was acknowledging my efforts. But, it was all just make believe. I who could never become a hero, was avoiding reality by indulging in meaningless training. In front of mom, I always remained positive, but deep down, I had resigned myself. I can't become an adventurer. I can't become a hero. As he said, I'm just a worthless wannabe hero who can't even save a single girl. Ah, well, that's fine. It's fine if I can't become an adventurer. It's fine if I can't become a hero. It's fine if I can't get back at those who insulted me. It's fine if I can't catch up to Ruby, who said she'll wait for me. Such dreams don't matter to me now. Right now, I just... I don't want to lose to the demon in front of me. I don't want to lose to the coward I've been until now. I don't want to lose. Don't want to lose? No. I will absolutely win. In an instant, in response to my shout, the rusty sword shone white. This was a phenomenon I had witnessed countless times, the level up of an artifact. By fighting a demon far superior, the level of the rusty sword had increased. It was just level 9 a moment ago. Name, rusty sword. Rank, F. Level, 10. Attack power, 10. Benefits, strength plus 0, endurance plus 0, agility plus 0, magic plus 0. Vitality plus zero. Skill. Evolution. Endurance points. 220. Rusty sword. Level 10. It's been a while since it last leveled up. Moreover, an unfamiliar skill had manifested in the rusty sword. Evolution? A skill I've never heard of. I wonder what effect this skill has. But, maybe because of that skill, the change in the rusty sword wasn't just a level up. Like a creature breaking out of its shell, the rust on the sword began to fall off. Soon, the true form of the artifact hidden within the rust was revealed. W what the? A pitch black blade that seemed to absorb all light, like the darkness of the night. The hilt was black as well, and the pinnacle was the visibly dark and ominous aura. It's like a artifact possessed by a demon, bestowed by an evil god. The eerie thing's true identity is. Name, Cursed Demon Blade. Rank, S. Level, Dash. Attack Power, 500. Benefits, Strength plus 500. Endurance plus 500, Agility plus 500, Magic plus 500, Vitality plus 500, Skill, Artifact Fusion, Endurance Points, 500 500, Cursed, Demon Blade, My rusty sword had transformed into an ominous artifact named the Cursed Demon Blade, Volume 01 Chapter Row 7, Rank, 
S. Level. Attack Power, 500. Blessings. Strength plus 500. Endurance plus 500. Agility plus 500. Magic plus 500. Vitality plus 500. Skill. Artifact Synthesis. Endurance, 500 500. The Attack Power and Blessings. All set at 500. In a realm where 300 is considered remarkable, this is excessively potent. As far as I know, this is undeniably a top tier artifact. Why has my rusty sword transformed into such a divine artifact? Why did its form suddenly change? No matter now. It feels as though strength is surging from within my body like spring water. This is the blessing bestowed by the artifact. A mighty power granted by the gods to humans. I don't feel like I'm going to lose. Ta. I repelled the demon's great sword that clashed against mine. Whereas moments ago it offered no resistance at all. Now I easily push it back. What? The demon, having his weapon pushed back, stumbles significantly. I seize the opportunity. With my artifact in hand, I slash at the demon's chest. What my rusty sword couldn't even scratch, I effortlessly tear through his demonic armor. Gwa. As blood splatters before me, the demon quickly distances himself from me. The wound is superficial. But he clutches his injured chest and glares at me with fury. Why you? You've... You've wounded me. I won't forgive you. Never. Did he have such confidence in his demonic armor? He seems furious at being injured. Driven by a rage, he swings his black great sword forcefully. With both power and speed, a blow that would overwhelm ordinary folk, I calmly deflect with my right hand. Damn. Uh -uh. The demon continues his assault relentlessly. Likewise, I parry each of the demon's attacks. The clash of artifacts creates intense pressure causing the surrounding trees to rustle loudly. Ta, ta, ta. Eventually, the demon halts his attacks, panting heavily. It seems even demons understand the concept of fatigue. A bit surprising. D damn it. Changing your strength so suddenly. Fine then, I'll show you the true power of my artifact. The demon raises his black great sword high, almost tauntingly. Enchantment magic, black flame. As he shouts, Black flames ignite upon his large sword. Even from a distance, the heat is palpable. A potent black flame indeed. Enchantment magic, huh? Artifacts are broadly categorized into two types. There are weapon-based artifacts and catalyst-based artifacts. Weapon-based artifacts, as the name implies, possess inherent attack power and are capable of directly assaulting demons. Catalyst-based artifacts, on the other hand, lack inherent attack power but can trigger supernatural phenomena called magic. Hence, those who wield catalyst-based artifacts are often referred to as sorcerers or mages by society. In battle, there's no clear superiority between the two types, it depends on the circumstances. Moreover, weapon-based artifacts also harbor magic to some extent, one of which is enchantment magic. It can enhance the artifact's attack power or imbue it with special effects. Judging by its appearance, his enchantment magic should have a power-boosting effect. He's betting everything on a single devastating blow. Ha <laughs> ha. With this, I've surpassed the attack power of your relic. Rot in hell. You worthless scum. The demon raised the massive sword wreathed in black flames with both hands and lunged forward with all his might. A lightning fast overhead slash. Seeing it coming, I prepared to block the strike with my right hand's cursed demon sword. No, I stood there with nothing in my right hand, instead, I braced with my left hand. In an instant, what? The massive sword of black flames descended towards my left hand as if being sucked in. Incredible force and heat surged through my left hand, yet I merely grimaced slightly as I effortlessly halted his most powerful strike. Why you caught it barehanded? My relic. No, this can't be. The demon seemed stunned by the reality before his eyes. But it was nothing extraordinary. I only did it because I thought I could. And now, it's my turn now. I firmly gripped the sword in my right hand. Swinging it down with force from my right shoulder, I cleaved the frozen demon before me. Ha. In one swift strike, I cleaved him in two. At the demon, now severed from left shoulder to right waist, collapsed to the ground weakly. With a gaze filled with astonishment and rage. He looked up at me. This can't be. My. Worn out relic. Gradually, the demon's body was enveloped in light. His entire form slowly transformed into particles of light, dissipating into the air. Damn. 
bastard. All that remained was his ominous black great sword. A brief silence settled over the scene. The intense battle from moments ago seemed like a distant memory, and I voiced my realization. I. I defeated the demon, me, who used to be a cowardly crybaby, me, who was supposed to possess the weakest relic, me, who used to be bullied. It's completely unbelievable. Yet, the sobbing from behind reminded me of the undeniable truth. Ugh. Hiccup. It was the girl who had almost been attacked by the demon. She still sat on the ground, her face contorted in tears. Both she and I were still alive. Approaching the girl once more, I bent down to meet her eye level. It's okay now. I defeated the scary demon, so you don't need to cry. As I comforted her, suddenly, my vision began to blur. As if the world were spinning, the scenery before me swayed. What's happening? Rapidly losing consciousness. I collapsed to the ground. Volume 01 Chapter 08 Volume 01 Chapter 08 Awakening Light brushed against my eyelids, and I felt the brightness, stirring me awake. Above, the familiar wooden ceiling greeted me. Most comforting was the sensation of the blanket against my back. Where? Am I? There could be no mistake. It was my room. Sunlight streamed in through the window, casting its glow upon my face. Morning had arrived. Which meant, from yesterday evening until now. I had been asleep, since battling the demon. Oh, last, you're awake, mom. As if on cue, my mother entered the room. She carried a plate of sliced fruit, likely brought as breakfast. But amidst all this, there were so many questions I wanted to ask. So, I attempted to inquire hastily to my mother as she placed the plate on the table. However, you collapse in the forest, and the guards helped you, dear. A. Is that so? My mother beat me to the explanation. So, the guards helped me. Did the Lumberjack brothers call for them? And that's how I ended up here. Yet, that wasn't the first thing I wanted to ask. The girl. Who was with me. No need to worry. She was crying nearby when you collapsed but was unharmed and safely taken care of. I see. That's a relief. After all, I managed to return to the village without any trouble. There was meaning in confronting the demon. Last helped her. Right? A. I heard from that girl. You protected her from the scary demon. She wanted me to convey her thank you when you woke up. Well done, last. I was taken aback by this unexpected report. Thank you, huh? Just receiving those words made it feel worthwhile to face the demon. It was scary, painful, and tough. But more than that, it felt satisfying now. I had defeated the demon and protected the girl. The realization seeped into my core. By the way, last defeating a demon. I was so happy when I heard that story. A. Eh? Why? Because, dear, whenever you go to the forest to fight monsters, you always come back looking as worn out as an old rag. Even to an amateur like me, it's clear that last is weak. W what? That's a bit too harsh. But I couldn't entirely deny it. Even against weak forest monsters, I ended up battered and bruised. Given that I received an F rank relic, it's only natural. So, for my mother, who had been watching over me all this time, it must have been a surprising turn of events for me to defeat a demon and protect a girl. Well, I'm still surprised myself. You've become strong, last, eh he. Also, the guards and the village chief were grateful. They said if it weren't for you, Red Village would have been in danger. You're truly a hero of the village, last. A hero, Huh? It's not entirely undeserved. A hero who protected not only the girl but also the village. Perhaps I've gotten a bit closer to the heroes I admire? Well, either way, I'm still inexperienced and not even an adventurer yet. So, I want to become an adventurer and... more and more. Oh, um, mom. I wanted to tell you. But once again, my mother beat me to it. You want to become an adventurer don't you? A. I've always wanted to become an adventurer. Once you become stronger, you should immediately pursue your dreams, right? It seemed like mom could see right through me. Yes, I wanted to set out on a journey right away. I want to become an adventurer, using the power to defeat demons, and fulfill my long cherished dream. But, I do want to become an adventurer. But, you know, I've been a burden on mom for so long, suddenly saying goodbye. It just doesn't feel right. It's okay. Go ahead and leave. Really? Well, I do feel a bit lonely, and I can't help but think you're a heartless son for leaving so suddenly. Ugh. My ears started to ache, and I couldn't help but grimace, 
but hearing mom's next words made my eyes grow warm. A son wants to do something. It's a mother's duty to give him a good kick forward. Do as you please, last. Mom, why does she always say the words I long for? Every time, I'm truly blessed to have her. I'm glad to be mom's son. I've always liked stories about adventurers. Finally, last, your dream is coming true. Especially, hero Krista. Was it? The hero you admire. That's right. You remembered well. Hero Krista. One of the heroes passed down through generations. Unlike other heroes, there aren't many remarkable tales about her but it seems she was bullied by other children when she was young. Her artifact wasn't anything extraordinary, but even so, Krista became an adventurer to get back at the bullies and quickly gain strength. Eventually, she became so strong that she could say, how's that? To the bullies. That's the story of hero Krista. Compared to other glorious hero tales, it leaves a slightly sinister, or rather, plain impression. But I was deeply moved by Krista's story. I want to help more and more people. I want to protect people attacked by demons. Even if they're bullied kids, like hero Krista. And this time, I'll catch up to Ruby for sure. Saying that, mom gave a wry smile. If that's what last has decided, I won't stop you. Go and rampage to your heart's content. It seems you already have enough power to defeat demons, so you'll be fine. Yeah. Thanks, mom. And so. I finally took the first step toward my dream. Oh, by the way, mom, do you know where my artifacts are? Huh? Artifacts? Oh, if that's what you mean, they're over there. Mom pointed to the corner of the room. When I looked there, sure enough, the artifacts were leaning against the wall. Did the guards bring them back? While I wanted to heave a sigh of relief about that, when I shifted my gaze to the corner of the room, my eyes widened, and I froze. Because there. Not only was my rusty sword but also another one, the pitch black great sword was leaning against the wall. That's right, the black great sword of the demon. And my artifact. It's restored. Volume 01 Chapter 09 Artifact Synthesis Why? Why is that demon's artifact here too? It wasn't a mistake or a trick of the mind. There, unmistakably, lay the massive sword that wolf demon had wielded resting in the corner of the room. The memory of that intense and terrifying battle flashed through my mind at the sight. Why is it here? The guards brought them both back because they couldn't figure out which one belonged to who. The black one looks like a demon's artifact, but it's so worn out, it doesn't seem like it could have defeated a demon. Even asking the girl didn't help, she just kept crying and couldn't tell. I see. Indeed, under those circumstances, it's unclear which one is my artifact. So bringing both back makes sense. Artifacts can be repaired if broken, but once lost, they never return, a cardinal rule for adventurers. But, setting that aside, why has my artifact returned to its original form? During the battle with the demon, it had transformed into a sinister sword. Its name, if I recall correctly, was the cursed demon sword. Will it revert to the rusty sword over time? Nevertheless, last, you managed to defeat the demon with that artifact. I don't know much about artifacts or fighting, but it must have been challenging to fight demons with the last artifact, right? Why yeah. I didn't think I could defeat it either. I took the leaning rusty sword and gazed at it intently. At that moment, the rusty sword began to emit a dark light. And like a breaking eggshell, the rust began to fall away. Eventually, all of it fell off, revealing the familiar jet black sword. Name. Cursed Demon Sword. Rank. S. Level. Attack Power. 500. Benefits. Strength plus 500. Endurance plus 500. Agility plus 500. Magic plus 500. Vitality plus 500. Skills. Artifact Synthesis. Durability. 500 500. It's done. I've successfully summoned the Cursed Demon Sword again. Since the Rusty Sword didn't have any magic or skills imbued in it. I didn't know how to activate it before. It seems like I can activate it if I want to. But, leaving that aside, my mother, who witnessed the transformation of the artifact before her eyes, was clearly astonished. This is the power of my artifact. Thanks to this, I was able to defeat the demon. If this artifact hadn't awakened, I don't think I could have won against the demon or protected that girl. I I see. Even after hearing the explanation. My mother's expression of surprise remained unchanged. Well, it's no wonder. It looks exactly like a demon's artifact. It's natural for others to be surprised if they see it. A anyway, 
it's good that you've become stronger, last. Yeah. Yes, even though it looks like a demon's artifact, the fact remains that I've become stronger. With this, I'll become an adventurer. And then, I'll help even more people and become the hero I've always admired. Well then, I'll prepare various things so you can leave on your journey whenever you want. Thank you, mom. You always make Bento and... Why are you being so formal? You don't need to thank me. I'm your mother, after all. My mother said that and left the room. Alone once again, I looked down at the artifact in my right hand. Name, Curse Demon Blade. Rank, S. Level, Attack Power, 500. Blessings, Strength plus 500, Endurance plus 500. Agility plus 500, Magic plus 500, Vitality plus 500, Skill, Artifact Synthesis, Durability, 500 500, Cursed Demon Blade, huh. Even upon closer examination, its properties are undeniably potent. An attack power and blessings all set at 500. Comparable to legendary artifacts that have left their mark in history, it holds no inferiority. But, what exactly does this rank signify? Weren't artifact ranks supposed to range from A to F? And there's no indication of a level either, it's quite an odd artifact. Indeed, it does seem like the artifact of a demon. With its ominous aura and immense power, it wouldn't be surprising if it appeared even more dreadful than the artifact of that demon I defeated yesterday. As I pondered, I walked towards where the demon's artifact was propped up. And once again, I gazed upon the black great sword. Then, almost absent-mindedly, I reached out to touch the artifact, attempting to confirm its properties. Name: Black Flame Great Sword. Rank: B. Level: 15. Attack power: 230. Blessings: Strength plus 280, Endurance plus 230, Agility plus 70, Magic plus 150, Vitality plus 200. Magic: Black Flame. Skill: two-handed sword durability 185 250 oh i can see it now by touching the artifact detailed information could be discerned the demon's artifact was no exception still it truly is a formidable artifact if i had ended up in a skirmish with the guards it could have turned dangerous of course in battle the performance of the artifact isn't everything. Victory or defeat can also hinge on the combat prowess of the wielder. But that demon seemed quite accustomed to combat. It would have likely caused significant damage. It's truly fortunate that I was able to stop it. But now isn't the time to bask in relief. I could see its properties, but it seems other people's artifacts can't be used. What should I do with this? Generally, Artifacts naturally disappear when their wielder is gone, and it takes a considerable amount of time for them to vanish. It might disappear eventually, but I have no idea when. Leaving such a ghastly artifact lying around in the room is unsettling, and it's too tasteless for interior decoration. Perhaps it's best to dispose of it sooner rather than later. Can it be burned as trash? As I contemplate disposing of the demon's artifact, suddenly, a purple light emanates from my right hand. Upon closer inspection, for some reason, Cursed Demon Blade was gleaming. What is happening? Gradually, the demon's artifact I had been touching began to move on its own. It floated gently in the air, drifting towards Cursed Demon Blade. Then, with a thud, it collided with it, seemingly absorbed into Cursed Demon Blade. It merged with my artifact it appeared so why did such a thing happen all of a sudden could my artifact have been affected by this with concern i checked the properties of cursed demon blade name cursed demon blade rank s level attack power 500 blessings strength plus 500 endurance plus 500 agility plus 500 magic plus 500 vitality plus 500 magic black flame skill Artifact Synthesis Durability 500-500 Huh? A new magic has appeared. In fact, isn't this magic the same as the one housed in the demon's artifact? What is going on? Has the power of the demon's artifact transferred? Could it be? Similar to properties, detailed information about skills can also be confirmed while touching the artifact. One skill, in particular, had caught my attention, so I decided to check it. Artifact Synthesis enables the synthesis of artifacts imbued with the blessing of the evil god, using them as enhancement materials. Acquires the imbued magic of the synthesized artifact. Limited to artifacts not currently equipped, 
activation achieved by bringing the enhancing material artifact in close proximity to the chosen artifact. I see. So, this is the effect of the skill. Artifact synthesis. This means that the demon's artifact has been incorporated. It's quite surprising, but knowing the effect of the skill. It's understandable. The artifacts imbued with the blessing of the evil god essentially refers to artifacts held by demons. And artifacts not currently equipped probably means artifacts whose owners are no longer present, right? So, Cursed Demon Blade has the power to absorb the artifacts of defeated demons. What an extraordinary power. With an already unfair attribute of all blessings set at 500. It could also absorb the power of demon artifacts. Could the reason for the absence of a level indication be because of this? Ordinary artifacts increase their levels to acquire magic and skills, but Cursed Demon Blade grows by synthesizing demon artifacts. It's quite a unique method of growth. This artifact is indeed peculiar. Anyway, the demon's artifact has been disposed of, and now I can embark on my journey without any worries. As I think this, suddenly, my vision begins to blur, as if the world were tilting sideways, the scenery in front of me. Chapter 10, Departure It seemed that the cursed demon blade could only be wielded for a limited time. In short, using it would exhaust one terribly. Exhaustion would eventually lead to collapsing. Hence, when I first used it, I lost consciousness right after defeating the demon. Considering the name Cursed Demon Blade, I wonder if it's under some sort of curse just as the title implies? Well. Regardless, it's an incredibly powerful artifact, so it would be odd if it could be used freely. From now on, I'll use the Cursed Demon Blade more cautiously. It seems this artifact isn't invincible after all. Anyway, after waking up from the second collapse, I decided to set off on my journey, carrying the provisions my mother had prepared for me. Take care, Mom. I'll definitely become an adventurer and show you. Take care. Last, I'm looking forward to hearing about your adventures. I nodded in response. I don't know if I can make a splash like Ruby did, but I'll do my best in my own way. As I was thinking that, Ruby's name came up. By the way, you should come back home occasionally. Ruby hasn't returned to the village even once since becoming an adventurer. Seems like her parents are feeling lonely. Well, Ruby is a platinum ranked adventurer so maybe she's busy. Becoming a famous adventurer means everyone relies on you. Besides, Ruby is part of Hero Party, so she must be really busy. So, in that case, when I become an adventurer and meet Ruby, I'll tell her. And next time, I'll come back to the village with Ruby. I'll listen to lots of stories about your adventures. Yeah, looking forward to it. Saying that, I left home. I kept waving my hand until the very end eventually disappearing from view. Then, I decided to cut through the forest and head to the town. To become an adventurer, one must take the exam and pass it. For that, I had to go to the town and participate in the exam. And on the way, hey, question mark. Suddenly, a male voice echoed from somewhere. I stopped and looked in the direction of the voice finding the lumberjack brothers there. It seemed like they were working as lumberjacks at the moment. But I think this place is far from where I usually see them. Why are they here? Do they need something from me? Um, sorry about before. Huh? We left you behind and ran away ourselves. You were actually really strong. Sorry for underestimating you. Taking down that demon by yourself, you're quite something. What? Um, thank you. I found myself at a loss for words caught off guard by their unexpected kindness. It felt awkward, almost uncomfortable. Unsure how to react to being spoken to in such a manner by the two who had previously looked down on me. Did they stop me just to say this? As I pondered this, it seemed there was more to it as one of the lumberjack brothers handed something over to me. Oh, uh, if you'd like. T this. Is it a sword sheath? Yeah, it's just a hobby of ours making various things from leftover wood. We noticed you were just carrying your artifact on your back before, so we thought you might need this. As an apology for abandoning you, we picked one that's similar in shape and size, but if it doesn't suit you, feel free to toss it away. Do as you please. T thank you. Their unexpected gesture left me speechless. It was genuinely difficult to respond. Surprisingly decent folks, aren't they? In any case, I immediately tried fitting my rusty sword into the sheath they gave me. To my surprise, it fit perfectly as if it was made for it. This should make it easier to move around. Plus, 
I won't attract as much attention with a battered artifact dangling around. With the sheath securely on my back, I bid farewell to the Lumberjack Brothers. Feeling more agile, I sprinted through the forest at full speed. My destination? The fledgling adventurer's town. Milkrond. I'll definitely pass the exam and become an adventurer. And so, my adventure begins. Wow, quite a crowd has gathered, he remarked. There were significantly more people gathered at the guild today than when he last saw it two days ago. Are they all aspiring adventurers? Considering everyone had what looked like artifact weapons equipped somewhere, that seemed to be the case. The competition seemed fierce. But would he be able to pass? He had heard that the pass rate for adventurer exams always falls below 10%. If he were to fail this time, the next exam wouldn't be until the beginning of next month. He'd be completely unemployed until then, so he really wanted to pass on this attempt. No, he had to pass to move forward. He would definitely pass. Well then, let's begin the adventurer's exam for this month, starting now. As he quietly pondered his worries. A voice of a young girl resonated from somewhere. In a place filled with adults, her voice sounded quite out of place, naturally sparking curiosity among those around. Everyone glanced around, but the girl who seemed to have spoken couldn't be seen. Soon, guild staff brought a table from the tavern, and someone was placed on it. A smiling girl with dazzling pink hair, holding the hand of a gothically lead doll. Was she the one who made the announcement earlier? Dressed in pink frilly clothes and with the doll. She looked nothing short of a little girl. Considering she declared the start of the exam, she was probably one of the examiners, but how old could she be? As questions filled the air, she responded with a radiant smile. I'm the examiner for this round, Charm Fleurite. Despite appearances, I'm a fully fledged adult who has received the blessing ceremony and a proper guild staff member. Her slightly drawn out voice echoed throughout the guild. She was indeed the examiner. Contrary to appearances, she seemed like a fully-fledged adult who had undergone the blessing ceremony. With a somewhat surprising feeling, as he watched the young girl stand on the impromptu podium, she began discussing the exam's details. So then let's announce the contents of the exam. This time, the exam will take place in an area called the Rainbow Forest, just outside the east gate of this town. You'll need to find it. Charm held up a smaller doll in her left hand. Not the gothic Lilita doll she had been holding before. What's that? As questioning gazes gathered, Charm provided an answer. As you can see, it's a doll. I'll place this test doll somewhere in the rainbow forest, so find it and bring it back to the guild. Ah, I see. So this exam is about finding things. The exam content changes every time, and the difficulty varies depending on the examiner. Sometimes, there are exams with unreasonable difficulty levels so he had prepared himself to some extent. This time, the exam seemed relatively simple. It's just finding something. Although he secretly felt relieved, his relief was short-lived as Charm's next words shattered it. By the way, the Rainbow Forest is teeming with snatch thieves. They have a habit of stealing things from humans even picking up lost items on their own. They've probably picked up all the test dolls left in the Rainbow Forest by now. So do your best to retrieve them. Ugh. The adventurer's exam wasn't going to be that easy. The content of the exam itself is searching for a doll in the forest. However, due to the presence of special monsters, the exam has become a mechanism based on defeating monsters. The exam seems to assess both exploration ability to search the monster infested area and combat ability. Of course, there are also other types of monsters infesting the area so it's dangerous. It's fine for participants to cooperate and face the exam together. I think it's natural for adventurers to form parties after becoming adventurers so it wouldn't be bad to practice that now. Cooperate, huh? Certainly, comrades are important. With cooperation, the pass rate of the exam could significantly increase. For those who form parties please bring back a test doll for each member. The time limit is two hours. Now, let the exam begin. With Charm's drawn out voice, the adventurer's exam began. The time limit was two hours. Considering the time to travel to the area, there was no time to waste. First of all, I need to. He needed to gather comrades quickly. But would there be anyone willing to form a party with him? Of course, potential allies would prefer someone strong. It's a given that they must have a powerful artifact. However, his artifact was just a rusty sword. No one would want to join a party with such an artifact. There's the strategy of showing off the cursed demon sword using the evolve skill, 
but the demon sword also looked terrible. It looked like the artifact of a demon, so no one would approach if he had such a sinister artifact. Besides, he didn't want to use the evolve skill before the exam. He wanted to keep the demon sword as intact as possible. What should he do? Looking around, he saw other participants forming parties and heading towards the rainbow forest which nationally made him feel anxious. He also wanted comrades quickly. As he thought that, suddenly, from somewhere. I told you, didn't I? I've been saying I don't want to since earlier. A voice filled with a girl's anger echoed. As the voice resonated so loudly, not only him but also those around him turned their gaze there. And there. Volume 01 Chapter 12 Artifact of the Shield Among the trio, two appeared to be twins, possibly sisters. They shared a similar stature, with narrow, almond-shaped eyes. Clad in matching long black dresses, their distinguishing features were their hair colors, one with a red ponytail and the other with a blue one. The artifact, a giant scythe, suspended on their backs, mirrored their identical facial features. Standing before them was a girl with purple hair, evidently their leader. She had tailored a robe, typically favored by mages, into a mini skirt wearing it with natural grace. She was the one who had raised her voice in anger moments ago. The reason for her ire was likely the silver-haired girl standing before the trio. With her shining silver short bob hair and a youthful face, she appeared frail, which made the large white shield on her back seem out of place. She stood before the purple-haired girl, her eyes filled with remorse. Why do we have to let a loser like you join our party? This is ridiculous. The purple-haired girl exclaimed. The silver-haired girl flinched, her shield trembling slightly on her back. From what could be gathered, the shield-bearing girl seemed to be pleading with the trio to join their party. And the leader, the purple-haired girl, seemed vehemently against it. While the exact reason was unclear, there had to be a more tactful way to decline, didn't there? Watching with slight discomfort, the silver-haired girl lowered her head once again. In me, joining the party? Didn't I already tell you to stop being so persistent? Do you even realize how useless you are? The leader continued, her tone harsh. The harsh words kept coming. Listen, adventurers are supposed to defeat demons. Yet, with a shield artifact like yours, incapable of defeating even a single demon, there's no way you could become an adventurer, right? To the leader's words, the twin sisters behind nodded in agreement. It seemed those four were acquainted with each other. Judging by how confidently they referred to the shield on the silver-haired girl's back as an artifact, they were more than just acquaintances. Friends. Seemed a bit off the mark. Well, even I, a non-looker, could tell that a shield was pretty useless against demons. But to boldly claim, incapable of defeating even a single demon, there had to be some basis for it. Or rather, what did that even mean? This trial revolves around defeating monsters. If we are to cooperate, it's preferable to have individuals with high combat capabilities. But teaming up with someone like you, unable to defeat demons, would be disadvantageous. We already need to gather one extra trial doll per person, the leader explained. If what she said was true, and the shield-bearing girl truly couldn't defeat a single demon, then she would indeed face many disadvantages in this trial. If they were to form a party, they'd have to secure an additional trial doll for her. Selecting party members was fundamental. However one phrased it, it seemed like sound reasoning. Yet, even so, the shield-bearing girl continued to plead with tearful eyes to the purple-haired girl. So, um, I have the power to protect, so I'll protect everyone from the monsters. Oh, for crying out loud. What do you mean by protective power? We don't need that. And we can't afford to delete Ali here. Just back off, you piece of junk. Growing impatient, she finally raised her right hand. I couldn't just stand there and watch anymore. Swiftly, I intervened between the girls, seizing the leader's wrist. Halting her hand, which was about to strike the shield-bearing girl's cheek, she turned her furious gaze towards me. Who are you? I'm another participant in the exam. Nice to meet you. Right. So, what do you want? What's with this hand? Nothing much. Just thought you were going a bit overboard. I could understand her perspective to some extent. If she didn't like it, there was no need to include the shield girl in the party. But resorting to violence was unacceptable. No matter how persistent, that was a line that couldn't be crossed. Returning the intense gaze of the girl with purple hair, she eventually shook off my grip with a disgruntled click of her tongue. This doesn't concern you. Besides, no matter what anyone says, 
I won't let her join our party, and I don't think I'm going overboard. She's the one at fault. Silently glancing at the shield girl, she seemed to feel ashamed, casting her eyes downward. Did she realize she was being too persistent? Even so, there was no need for that expression. If you aspire to be an adventurer too, you understand, right? How useless this girl with the shield artifact is. And yet, she relies on us, fellow villagers because there's no one else to talk to. Despite being unable to defeat a single monster on her own, I see. They knew each other because they were from the same village. And the shield girl had been persistently approaching them because there was no one else to rely on. In that case, wouldn't it be cruel to dismiss her as a fellow villager? Well, maybe there were some unresolved issues precisely because they were from the same village. In fact, her expression as she glared at me and the shield girl vividly portrayed it. If you understand, then back off too. Or, how about you take the exam with this piece of junk? Do you think you can pass the test with this clumsy and useless girl? Provoked by her challenge-like tone, I glanced at the shield girl again. Her lack of confidence was incomparable to others. Her slender figure didn't seem accustomed to battle at all. A piece of junk, clumsy useless. The owner of the shield artifact unable to defeat even a single demon. After staring at her, who had been judged as such, I nodded firmly. All right, then let's do that. Huh? Hey, if you're up for it, why don't you team up with me? I was just looking for companions myself, and let's take the adventurer's exam together. What? The one who exclaimed and surprised was the girl with purple hair. As for the shield girl, she seemed stunned her eyes wide open. It's not surprising she's surprised. Even though there's malice, inviting a girl who's been called clumsy and useless to join the party is nothing short of a joke. Looking around, the other participants who had overheard our conversation seemed equally astonished by my words and actions. Well, that's beside the point. I gave the shield girl, who remained unresponsive, one final push. Because, probably, we're really compatible. Why yes. This time, the shield girl showed me a reaction of surprise. Volume 01 Chapter 13 Swords and Shields hmm, Seems like they're not falling normally. Examination Dolls Why yes, indeed. Approximately 30 minutes since the start of the examination, I walked through the seven-colored forest with a girl carrying a shield on her back. Area, seven-colored forest. A forest where grass and trees shimmer like colorful jewels, which has become a tourist attraction in this area. However, Due to the proliferation of monsters, it is a place where ordinary people are cautioned not to enter. We ventured into the forest and peeked behind trees and into bushes. Our purpose, of course, was to find the examination dolls. Yet, they were nowhere to be found. Adventurer exams are indeed not as straightforward as one might think. As the examiner said, it seems likely that monsters have picked them up and are carrying them around. If we can avoid fighting monsters, that would be better but it doesn't seem so easy. Let's actively search for a snatch thief from here on, I said. The girl with the shield didn't reply, but I continued deeper into the forest. Her behavior has been strange since earlier. She's unusually quiet. I wonder what's wrong? After all, she accepted my invitation afterward. We formed a party safely, and now we're searching for examination dolls together, but her face seems troubled. Maybe she didn't want to team up with me? Perhaps she just agreed at the moment due to the atmosphere, but now regrets it. I'd prefer to continue the exam with her, but if she's not happy, then dissolution might be inevitable. As I pondered, she finally spoke up. Um, um, what exactly do you mean by us having good compatibility? She asked. Huh? Oh, I never explained that. Did I? I realized belatedly. I hadn't mentioned it even though I used it as an invitation to the party, so it remained inadequately explained. I forgot about it. And good compatibility could lead to misunderstandings depending on how it's interpreted. Could her strange behavior and silence since earlier be because of that? Her cheeks seem to be flushed if I look closely. So, although belatedly, I hurriedly tried to explain. Oh our compatibility means. It's nothing weird just but right before i could finish suddenly something leapt out from the bushes behind us Greya, a a monster the girl with the shield screamed correctly what jumped out from the bushes was a wolf-like monster it was almost the same size as me with a gaping mouth and gleaming fangs and in its momentum it lunged for my head quickly 
I reached behind my back with my right hand and drew my rusty sword. T that worn out artifact won't. Seeing my artifact, the girl with the shield was clearly shaken. It's a natural reaction. Despite what they say about not judging by appearances, there's hardly any reliable criteria to trust in artifacts. Especially for someone seeing it for the first time, it's understandable that they wouldn't think this artifact could counter monsters. So the girl hastily raised her large shield and tried to come between me and the monster, but I stopped her with my left hand. Evolve. Instantly, black light emanated from the rusty sword. The rust fell away like breaking an eggshell, revealing its true form hidden inside, before us. Ta. With a swift swing, I cleaved through the wolf before me as if slicing through air causing it to dissipate entirely in a scattering of light. Incredible. The girl with the shield gawked in amazement. Rather than being surprised at dispatching the monster in a single blow, she seemed more taken aback by my artifact itself. From a battered sword to a weapon akin to a demon's relic, the transformation was indeed remarkable, understandably so for its astonishment. I hurried to explain. This is my artifact, the cursed demon blade. It transforms using the skill evolution. I'm sorry for startling you. I see. While she appeared surprised, she didn't seem particularly frightened. Phew, that's a relief. If she had fled because it resembled a demon's relic, I wouldn't know what to do. With that initial anxiety eased, the girl with the shield tilted her head as she examined the cursed demon blade. So, wouldn't it be better to keep it in that state indefinitely? Why bother reverting to the battered artifact? Her question was valid, though it worked out this time. Had I not been able to keep up, I might have lost my head. Keeping it in the state of the cursed demon blade would indeed be smarter than staying with the battered sword. This artifact tires me out immensely while in use. I could collapse from exhaustion. A. I can use the cursed demon blade continuously for about 3 minutes. That's it. So, I can't keep it in this state indefinitely. I revert to the battered sword once the battle is over and only use the cursed blade during combat. Through my own research. I've gradually learned about this artifact. There's a time limit on my cursed demon blade. Using it exhausts me greatly, and if I push too hard, I might lose consciousness. That time limit is approximately 3 minutes. It feels quite short, but it's an improvement from the beginning. It seems that I get used to the evolution skill over time, gradually extending the time limit. But it's only a few seconds of progress so it'll take an enormous amount of time before I can use it freely. That's why I've adopted the conservation method of only summoning the cursed demon blade during battles. Ah, could it be that we're compatible? That's right. If I get too tired to use the cursed demon blade, I'd like you to protect me with your shield. I'll be able to use it again after a short rest. Well, it sounds pathetic, but when I have the battered sword, I'm terribly useless. Ha <laughs> ha. I chuckled with a wry smile. Has the foul-mouthed girl with purple hair rubbed off on me? But the reality remains unchanged. I'm incompetent. So, it would be a tremendous help if the girl with the shield could assist me. With that belated explanation concluded, the girl nodded with a brightened expression. I. I understand. If there's anything I can do, I'll do my best. Yeah, I'm counting on you. Oh, um. A lingering question remained. By the way. We haven't exchanged names yet. I'm last. Last stone. And yours? I. I'm Dia. D.E.A. Carrot. Nice to meet you, Last San. Nice to meet you too, Dia San. I smiled and shook hands with Dea once again. It's truly a pleasure to have you on board. As I mentioned to her earlier, my divine tool has a fatal weakness. If it's not supplemented, it's conceivable that I might lose my life during this exam. Safety isn't guaranteed during the adventurer's exam. That's the underlying premise. Therefore, I can't afford to be careless even during the test. I must be prepared to face the possibility of being killed by monsters at any moment. In such circumstances, being someone who can only use their power for a limited time makes me incredibly weak. I have no reliable companions, nor do I possess stable strength. And then, there's the girl with a shield divine teal who appeared out of nowhere. There couldn't have been a more perfect fit for my companion. Well, inviting Dea to join me wasn't solely for that reason. I recall what happened at the guild. Dea, being scolded loudly enough for everyone to hear. If I hadn't invited her to join me at that moment, she probably wouldn't have been able to form a party with anyone else, given how loudly she advertised her incompetence. Likewise, I doubted anyone would want to team up with someone who got involved in that trouble along with me. So, 
The optimal solution at that moment was for Daya and I to form a party from the get-go. Well, there's no point dwelling on the past. Now that the belated introductions are out of the way, shall we resume our search for the figurines? I suggested. As I was about to set off once again, suddenly, from the bushes behind us, another creature leapt out with a wrestle. But this time, it wasn't a wolf, it was some sort of dwarf creature. Chapter 14 the indomitable great shield. His gaunt face wore a long, pointed nose. Wrapped around his waist was a coarse fabric sash, and he wore a pointed hat pulled down low over his eyes. Cackle. With a mischievous voice reminiscent of a playful child, he lunged towards us. He raised his small fist, ready to pounce on me. Watch out. I prepared to intercept with my sword, but before I could, Dea stabbed in front of me. She wielded a colossal shield resembling four open white petals precisely intercepting the attacks of the little assailant. With just a single resounding clang, she completely nullified the small attacker's assault. Wow. Watching from behind, I couldn't help but exclaim in admiration. Direct attacks from monsters typically had to be defended against with relics. Just as ordinary weapons devoid of divine power couldn't harm enchanted armor, conventional armor couldn't withstand attacks enhanced by magic. It was as if armor and shields were mere paper against such assaults. Inevitably, defense relied on sword blades or spear shafts, leaving very few surfaces to guard against attacks. Compared to that, there was a strong sense of security in using a relic shield to ward off attacks. Thus, Dea standing before me with a great shield raised suddenly seemed reassuringly dependable. Cackle. The little assailant, undeterred by his thwarted attack, clung onto Dea's shield. With eerie laughter, he relentlessly hammered the surface of the shield. His assault on the girl, accompanied by his maniacal laughter, was nothing short of madness. Eek. Although visibly frightened, Dea continued to hold her shield steady, deflecting the onslaught. Even though she was supposed to be fighting a monster, it looked more like she was playing with a child. Was the monster not as strong as it seemed? But still, the situation was no time for idle speculation. Dea step back. Finally swinging my sword towards the little assailant, he quickly reacted and moved away from the shield. Dea was too close, and it was dangerous. I didn't strike with full force, but it should have been a considerable speed. To dodge it at the last moment, he must have been quite agile, as his appearance suggested. Cackle. Once again, he raised his fist and lunged at me. This time, Dea moved to intervene again, but I gestured with my left hand to stop her. With the cursed magic sword at my disposal, there was no need for her to shield me like before. This time, I would counter his attack skillfully. So, I decided to block the little assailant's straight punch with the cursed magic sword. Thud. His fist struck the blade with unexpected force, causing me to widen my eyes in surprise. I had underestimated the weight of his attack, despite its small size. Regardless of their appearance, Monsters were still monsters, and Dea had been consistently blocking such heavy attacks, truly fitting for the wielder of the relic shield. However, as the wielder of the relic sword, I couldn't afford to be outdone. Ha! I delivered a powerful blow with my left fist, not with the divine artifact, to the gnome clinging to my sword. Thanks to the blessing of the cursed demon blade, my strength had increased significantly. Unlike divine artifacts, I couldn't damage magical armor with it but it was more than enough to send opponents flying and staggering. As expected, the gnome monster groaned in pain and was blown back towards the large tree behind. The impact of hitting the tree momentarily froze its movements. Seizing the opportunity, I closed the distance in a single bound. Take this. He's quick. He understood that well from observing my movements earlier. So, I'll decide the match in this momentary pause. I swung the cursed demon blade up to my left hip and slashed at the gnome with all my might this time. K. K. Despite being bisected in a single blow, it still emitted a laugh-like groan. Then, it dissolved into particles of light. Confirming the successful defeat, I returned the cursed demon blade to its rusted form, the rusty sword, and sheathed it on my back. The evolved state had been maintained for about two minutes. Although I didn't feel too exhausted yet, I needed to be cautious as fatigue could suddenly hit. I should periodically revert to the rusty sword to facilitate recovery. Phew, well done, 
Dia. T. Thank you. Well done to you too. That was quite an eerie monster. I wonder what its purpose was? I I wonder. We commended each other's efforts and glanced at the spot where the gnome had vanished. What could have been the objective of that monster? Unlike the wolf monsters that clearly aim to kill us, I felt a different intention from the gnome-like creatures. Harming us seems secondary. Oh, but right now, there's something I wanted to tell Dia. Nevertheless, Dia, that was impressive. Huh? That monster's attacks didn't seem to affect you at all, despite being beaten up so badly earlier. You um, thank you very much. Diamond blushed visibly, hiding her face behind the shield. I seem to have embarrassed her with my straightforward praise. Setting that aside. I continued while looking at the shield she held. Is the durability of your artifact okay? If it seems like it's about to break, don't push it. If an artifact were to break within the area, it would be a major issue. We must also consider going to the temple if necessary. Returning to town, repairing the artifact at the temple, and coming back to the rainbow forest would be tight on time, but it's a matter of life and death. Well, even if the artifact breaks. I'll protect you until we return to town, so don't worry. Oh, no. If it's about the durability of the artifact, I don't think you need to worry. Huh? Diamond peeked out from behind the shield and said so with a nonchalant expression. No need to worry about the durability? Why did she say that with such a surprised look on her face? Since you told me about Last's artifact, consider it a return favor. Please take a look. Saying so. Diamond handed the shield to me. Does she want me to check its properties by touching it? An artifact is, in a way, a reflection of the person's talent. Many people dislike having their properties examined because it's akin to exposing their inner selves. But now, I'm being asked by a girl of about the same age to check its properties. Well, then, without further ado. With that in mind, I gently touched the shield resembling a white flower and checked its properties. Name. The indestructible great shield. Rank, A. Level, 5. Attack power, 0. Blessings, strength plus 50, durability plus 240, agility plus 0, magic plus 50, vitality plus 220. Skill, indestructible. Durability, slash. Huh? Seeing the properties of the shield, I couldn't help but widen my eyes. Title, Volume 01 Chapter 15, Unconsciousness. Title Enhancement. Chapter 15, Unconsciousness. Name, Invincible Great Shield. Rank, A. Level, 5. Attack Power, 0. Blessings, Strength plus 50, Endurance plus 240, Agility plus 0, Magic plus 50, Vitality plus 220. Skill, Invincibility. Endurance, Slash. What's with this endurance value? It's showing a number I've never seen before. Is there some sort of anomaly in the properties? And this invincible great shield, isn't it astonishing that it's a divine artifact of a rank? Just like Ruby's flame dragon great sword, it's of the highest rank of divine artifacts. A definite proof of harboring extraordinary talent. Moreover, there's a skill imbued in the artifacts that I've never seen before. Invincibility. Divine artifacts endurance does not decrease. Grants poison resistance to the wielder. Grants curse resistance to the wielder. With the effect of the, invincibility, skill, my shield's endurance doesn't decrease. That's why the property's endurance is showing strange values. Also, poisons and curses don't affect me. So, you see. There's absolutely no worry about the artifact or me breaking. The silver-haired girl spoke as if it were perfectly natural, showing no signs of saying anything strange. She seems to have little knowledge about divine artifacts and combat, judging from her appearance. So, it's no wonder she doesn't understand. To such a child, I decided to open my mouth again to make her understand my greatness. This invincible great shield is an incredible divine artifact. Huh? I is that so? Yeah, sure. It might not have attack power and might not be able to defeat demons, but since the artifact won't break and the wielder is granted all sorts of resistances, it's truly an invincible shield. You should have said, I have the power to protect myself with more confidence! Exclamation mark. As I praised her overly, Dia stood there dumbfoundedly. Soon, her face turned red like heated iron and she hid her expression behind the shield once again. What's there to be so embarrassed about? She should have more confidence. Even towards that trio, she said, 
I have the power to protect myself very unconfidently. If she had properly acknowledged her own strength and confidently appealed, maybe things wouldn't have turned out like that. That's how much potential this child has. I felt like I had found a treasure that no one else had noticed. T that's too much praise, last San. It's not such a big deal. No, no, Dia should be aware of her own greatness. Also, since her level is still likely to increase, and there seems to be some benefit in magic, she might eventually learn powerful granting magic, right? I'm really looking forward to it. You usually, granting magic is for increasing attack power or for special attacks, so it's unlikely to be imbued in the shield artifact. But since the rank of the artifact is A, there's plenty of potential for awakening some new power. It's truly an artifact to look forward to in the future. All that's left is for Dia to have confidence in her own power and stand before everyone. In any case, after confirming each other's strength in two battles, we decided to resume our search for the test dolls. And just as we were about to start walking again, something caught my eye at the edge of my vision causing me to reflexively stop in my tracks. It emerged from the thicket where the little demon-like creatures had darted out just moments ago. What drew my attention was, something resembling a human hand. I couldn't help but feel a surge of surprise, yet the hand seemed somehow devoid of life, prompting me to squint and examine it closely. What's that? I approached the thicket and reached out to grasp the hand. What emerged was a doll of a girl dressed in gothic Lolita attire. A doll I felt like I'd seen somewhere before. Could this possibly be one of those test dolls for passing the adventurer's exam? I believe so. I exchanged glances with Daya to confirm. Indeed, this was identical to the test doll the examiner had. But why was it here in this thicket? Could it be something that little creature was carrying? It did dart out from this thicket earlier. Oh. I see. So, the little creature from earlier was what the examiner referred to as a snatch thief? It seems. So, ah, I see. It all makes sense now. If that little creature was a snatch thief, then it makes sense it was clinging persistently to our artifacts. A creature with the habit of snatching things humans possess. It was trying to steal our artifacts from our hands. It seems it would attempt to snatch the artifacts we are equipped with without exception. If things had gone awry, it might have taken away items like the cursed demon sword or the indestructible great shield. As long as they're not destroyed, the benefits won't disappear, but losing them would render us unable to use magic or skills, so losing them would be unacceptable. Anyway, I'm glad everything ended without incident. And now, that's one down. Let's find another one like this quickly and pass the exam together. Why yes. And so, we acquired one of the test dolls. Next. We started searching for the second doll. Since the two of us are taking the exam together, we definitely want to secure one more. But if it looks like we won't make it in time, I'll let Daya have this one. To be honest, I feel like Daya is more talented than me. If one of us were to become an adventurer first, she'd definitely be the better choice. If her power were to become known, she'd undoubtedly receive invitations from many parties. Moreover, even if we were to fail this exam, there's still a chance of getting a recommendation if we catch someone's eye. I can't just pass by someone like Dea and become the only one to pass. After all, my artifact is either a rusty sword with weak attack power or a cursed demon sword that drains the wielder's stamina. It couldn't be more unreliable. As I pondered this, just as we were about to resume our search for the test dolls. Oh, Dea, what a coincidence to meet you here. Suddenly. A girl's voice came from behind. Caught completely off guard, we hastily turned around. And there they were. Oh, it's you guys. The trio of girls who callously rebuffed Daya's plea at the start of the exam. Chapter 16, The Amethyst Bracelet. A dazzling girl with flowing amethyst-colored hair, clad in a short magician's robe resembling a miniskirt, trailed by her sister carrying a scythe on her back. As I gazed at them in awe, Diamond, standing beside me, seemed equally astonished. Ah, Amethyst San, what are you doing here? It seemed the purple-haired girl went by the name Amethyst. Upon hearing Diamond's murmur, I finally learned the name of the girl before me. So, why was this Amethyst here? Currently, the seven-colored forest, where the adventurer's exam was being conducted, was vast compared to other areas. The chances of encountering fellow exam participants in such a vast expanse were extremely low. Moreover, 
It would be quite a coincidence to bump into those who caused trouble at the start of the exam. Were they following us? No, that couldn't be it. At first, I was genuinely surprised that you decided to take the exam with that guy. I'm amazed you made it here unscathed, Diamond, despite being such a klutz. Mockingly, Amethyst spoke, and Diamond, feeling uncomfortable, averted her gaze. As I had thought during the start of the exam, these two really didn't get along. The two behind Amethyst were merely amused spectators, indicating they didn't think highly of Diamond either. Did she approach us just to say such things? Now, Amethyst's mocking gaze shifted to me. Moreover, not listening to my advice and dragging Diamond along, you're quite foolish, aren't you? So, how does it feel to be burdened with incompetence? Or perhaps you've fallen for Diamond? A blatant provocation. It felt oddly nostalgic. Having been bullied since childhood, teased to the point of exhaustion by Elio and the other kids, I sighed inwardly and glanced at Diamond beside me. If you say I've fallen for her at first sight, then maybe I have. A. I fell for Diamond at first sight and invited her to take the exam with me. La last sin? Diamond blushed bright red clearly surprised. Meanwhile, I, while thinking she would be embarrassed, continued looking at her immortal great shield. Because, having a divine artifact like the shield is a remarkable talent. When I saw Diamond with it, I wanted her to join us. It's strange that no one else invited her to join. I I see. Diamond's shoulders slumped suddenly. Even though it had been less than an hour since the exam began. I found many good things about Diamond without even trying. Although her initial impression of being timid and shy hadn't changed, I was touched by her kindness and reliability that occasionally shone through. I believed someone like her should become an adventurer. I forcefully conveyed my honest feelings to Amethyst. Ha ha. You're saying quite passionate things. To think you'd be so supportive of the scribe baby who was bullied in the village. Even though she'll never become an adventurer. Even if you say that. We've already obtained one test doll. Diamond has the potential to become an adventurer. That's the irrefutable proof. I said so and showed the test doll we had just acquired to Amethyst and her companions. For a brief moment, her eyes widened, then narrowed like threads. Oh, you've obtained the doll. That's right. But we still need one more to pass together. We're going to search for it now. We don't have much time, so we're leaving. See you. Although I gave a casual farewell. I wanted to leave their presence as soon as possible due to a sense of unease or premonition. Above all, the lack of time was a genuine concern. We needed to obtain another test doll and return to the guild. I didn't want to get involved in any more trouble. Feeling hurried, I grabbed Diamond's hand somewhat forcefully and began to walk, but Amethyst called out to us. You know, we still only have one doll in our possession. She remarked. Question mark so what? Taken aback by the abrupt statement, I halted and turned around. There, Amethyst, sporting the same mocking smile as before, aimed a sharp, hunter-like gaze in our direction. I recall the examiner saying that having a doll was enough, she continued, her tone dripping with sarcasm. Huh? What? Are you talking about? Wherever and however you obtain it. That's acceptable, right? Dash. In an instant, Diamond raised her shield. Back off, last San. Amethyst thrust her right hand forward. Amethyst. Instantly, purple lightning surged from her palm. With a deafening roar, lightning streaked towards us. Though the lightning approached at terrifying speed, Diamond anticipated it and absorbed the blow with her, indestructible great shield. The thunderous impact resonated. Ugh! Diamond winced slightly, but that alone was enough to withstand Amethyst's violent lightning attack. Impressive. I'd likely lose consciousness instantly if I, in my current state, were to endure such an assault, yet she bore it without flinching. However, her counterattack was equally formidable. Was that purple lightning just now? Magic? And she directly unleashed it from her palm. And to think she's firing such dangerous things at us. These aren't spells aimed at fellow participants. Participants can engage in conflict and it's not explicitly prohibited. Accidents and injuries are your own responsibility, so it's only natural to be prepared to be stolen from if you've taken this exam, right? That's what you both agreed to, Amethyst declared, launching another bolt of purple lightning. One strike, two strikes, three strikes, lightning flashed in succession. Diamond blocked them all with her, indestructible great shield, 
leaving me awestruck. This wasn't a sight you'd expect in an adventurer's exam. Both of them already possess incredible strength. But now isn't the time to be thinking about that. As expected of Diamond, the shield bearer. But mere defense won't win you the match. Can you really become an adventurer like that? Amethyst taunted. If it's come to this, we have no choice but to fight. Irritatingly, what Amethyst says isn't entirely wrong. Indeed, the examiner only said to bring back the exam dolls. The method wasn't specified. So, it doesn't matter if we take dolls from other participants. This exam probably considers such participant conflicts. After all, apprehending apostates falls within the scope of an adventurer's duties. Those who misuse divine artifacts bestowed by the gods to defeat demons or deemed apostates. Combat against such individuals will surely come sooner or later, so perhaps this exam is meant to familiarize us with PvP combat as well. At its core, if you're not strong, you won't make it as an adventurer. If you're strong, you pass, if you're weak, you fail. This exam simply rationalizes that. Regardless, now's not the time to hesitate. Diamond, what's Amethyst's artifact? A. If it's come to this, we have to fight. We need to destroy her artifact to neutralize her. I charge forward to destroy Amethyst's artifact. To do that, I need to know what her artifact is. Considering they're from the same village, I assumed Diamond would know. Amethyst's artifact is likely a catalytic type enabling the use of magic just by wearing it. But where is it equipped and what form does it take? I have no idea. So, I asked Diamond, but she seemed genuinely puzzled. Does she not know Amethyst's artifact? No, that's not the reaction I'm seeing. She appears deeply bewildered by my declaration to fight. It's as if she's saying, fighting them? Absolutely not. Well, it's clear that she has a significant aversion to Amethyst and her companions. If I were told to fight Elio Kun, Considering everything that's happened, I'd probably hesitate too. Perhaps it's best not to have Diamond fight them, even though it's regrettable. Ensuring safety, I should just hand the exam dolls over to them and resolve this situation peacefully. And just as I quietly waver, Diamond shouts with determination on her face. The bracelet called, Amethyst's armlet, attached to her right wrist. Please, last San. From her cry, I could sense a strong resolve, to become an adventurer. We must fight, if we don't stand up here, we won't become adventurers. Volume 01 Chapter 17 Interpersonal Combat Fundamentally, in interpersonal combat, victory lies with the destruction of the artifact. In other words, it signifies defeat for the party whose artifact is destroyed. Not only does one lose the benefits bestowed by the artifact, but they also lose access to magic and skills, and their divine power dissipates. The artifact becomes nothing more than junk. Hence, by destroying the artifact, one can render their opponent completely powerless. That, indeed, is the conclusion of interpersonal combat. Therefore, I inquired of Dea about the Amethyst's artifact. His artifact is a purple bracelet attached to his right wrist. It is called the Bracelet of Violet Lightning. It's indeed a catalyst type artifact. Catalyst type artifacts grant significant magical power when equipped. Moreover, they allow for the use of more versatile magic than the enchantments imbued in weapon type artifacts. Like Amethyst's current ability to unleash lightning from his palm. Unlike weapon type artifacts, catalyst type artifacts can also perform long range attacks, making them quite troublesome. However, it's challenging to argue that catalyst type artifacts are superior to weapon type artifacts. Catalyst type artifacts are much fragile compared to weapon type artifacts. Their durability is likely no more than two digits at best. Therefore, if one can get close enough to land an attack, destroying the artifact is easy. And once the artifact is destroyed, they become unable to use lightning magic rendering them completely powerless. While waiting for their magical power to deplete is an option, it's not a luxury we can afford. But can I really land an attack on the bracelet? My hand might slip and end up slashing through the entire arm. This is not the time for such self-doubt, so I drew the rusty sword from its sheath on my back. Upon seeing it, Amethyst widened his eyes for a moment before bursting into laughter. Ha ha, what's that? Bringing out such a dirty sword? Surely that can't be your artifact. I would retort if I could, but I was sharpening my focus on seizing the opportunity to attack. Indeed, you are a perfect match for being incompetent and useless, Dea. Let's crush you here and now. After all, if you're not strong enough, 
you're not fit to be an adventurer. The onslaught of Amethyst's lightning magic continued relentlessly. Daya continued to endure it with his indestructible shield, so for now, there was no issue. However, the electric shocks from the violent lightning were gradually wearing down Daya, even with his shield. Despite her endurance, it seemed difficult for her to withstand repeated magical attacks. Moreover, Amethyst's magic being lightning was the worst possible match. It's about time we make a move. I glanced down at the rusty sword in my right hand. In the previous battle, I had sustained the sword state for barely two minutes. Feeling a slight fatigue, I probably had only a little time left to use the cursed sword. One minute? No, even half of that, 30 seconds would be good enough. There's hardly any room for error. Moreover, the sensation of being corroded from within is not something one can easily get used to. It's a feeling akin to constantly running at full speed. Rather, it feels painful and suffocating, eventually knocking out consciousness altogether. Frankly, there's a part of me that finds it frightening. However, just as Dea had made up her mind, so have I. Even if my body is being corroded by the curse, I won't be deterred. So lend me your strength now, curse sword. Evolve. With a murmured incantation, the blade of the rusty sword began to gleam ominously, its previously encrusted surface crumbling away to reveal its true form underneath. From tip to hilt, it was coated in a deep, glossy black, emanating a malevolent aura. Name, Curse Demon Blade Rank, S Level, Attack Power, 500 Attributes, Strength plus 500, Endurance plus 500. Agility plus 500, Magic Power plus 500, Vitality plus 500 Magic, Dark Flame, Skills, Artifact Synthesis, Durability, 500-500. Instantly, my body felt as light as feathers, my senses sharpening as if expanding my field of vision. The blessings from the artifact surged through me like goosebumps. I could literally feel my own strength increase. With the determination to end the battle in an instant, I leapt from behind cover emerging from the shadows. As I sprinted towards Amethyst and her companions, they gawked in astonishment at my artifact. What? What is that? The sudden transformation of the artifact was a bizarre phenomenon. And if it resembled the artifacts wielded by demons, their surprise was understandable. Ignoring their bewildered expressions, I dashed forward at the maximum speed my agility allowed. Take this, violent thunder. Anticipating my approach. Amethyst unleashed her violet lightning. I dodged it effortlessly, closing the distance between us. Thanks to the blessings from the cursed demon blade, my vitality had significantly increased. Consequently, my reflexes, serving as a defense mechanism, were honed to perfection, capable of reacting to lightning fast attacks. I narrowly evaded or deflected the lightning bolts with my blade. What? What is going on here? In almost an instant, I closed the gap between us and suddenly, they changed their formation. Spinel, Lapis, we're counting on you. We won't let you down. Amethyst stepped back, allowing the scythe-wielding sisters to take the front line. They drew their scythes from their backs. Protecting Amethyst, they joined the crescent blades of their weapons together. Enchanting magic, flame scythe. Enchanting magic, ice scythe. The redhead's scythe crackled with fiery magic while the blue-haired girl's blade shimmered with icy energy. Their combined might was impressive. Their artifacts were probably ranked around C, with decently high levels. Two powerful artifacts, each enchanted with elemental magic. Normally, even an E-ranked artifact might struggle to penetrate such a defense. But with my cursed demon blade, hi ah gripping the demon blade tightly with both hands, I swung it downward. As their scythes clashed against my blade, the moment of impact. The red and blue scythes shattered as easily as brittle cookies, leaving them stunned. Volume 01 Chapter 18, Reasons for Confrontation The twin sighty masters stared wide-eyed as their artifacts shattered. Even Amethyst, who had been guarded by them, was left dumbfounded when her defense was effortlessly pierced in a single strike. This, this is impossible, she muttered her arm with a bracelet dangling limply by her side as she stood frozen in disbelief, despite me, the enemy, standing right before her. Undoubtedly, she had placed considerable trust in the abilities of the sisters Spinel and Lapis. Watching their artifacts, upon which they had relied so heavily, shattered before their eyes seemed to have momentarily halted their thought processes. It was understandable given the circumstances. Meanwhile, 
Due to the curse of my cursed sword, I felt a sharp pain in my head and chest. I staggered involuntarily, almost losing my footing. Yet, before I could falter completely, Diamond, who had been watching from behind, rushed to my side. With genuine concern etched on her face, she leaned in to whisper, Are you alright, last sin? Yeah, I'll manage somehow. No need to worry about me, I replied in a hushed tone. With that, I quickly reverted the cursed sword back into the rusty sword. Instantly, the burden lifted, and my body felt lighter, as if relieved from the weight of lead. Phew, that was close. I had pushed it to the limit with the time constraint. Although I would need a few minutes of rest before I could use the cursed sword again, it seemed unnecessary at the moment. Meanwhile, Amethyst glared at both Diamond and me, frustration evident in her gritted teeth. With her companion's artifacts destroyed, she was now the sole bearer of a catalyst-type artifact. With limited magical energy and an overwhelmingly disadvantageous situation, she found herself in a tight spot. On the other hand, our artifacts appeared intact from the opponent's perspective. While my artifact required a brief respite before it could be used again, they were unaware of this limitation, mistakenly believing they held the upper hand. Hence, despite Amethyst's impulsive nature, she wasn't foolish enough to make a reckless gamble at this juncture. Instead, she stood protectively in front of the Psyche Master Sisters, spouting words that sounded akin to sour grapes. These girls' artifacts were ranked C-class. To think you could destroy both of them in a single strike, even with enhancement magic. Just who do you think you are? I thought it was a reasonable question. Considering even I didn't fully understand myself. Who exactly was I? What was my artifact? What was this cursed sword? Until I could find those answers, I could only offer a simplistic response to Amethyst, similar to what I had said upon our first meeting. You're just another participant in the trials, like yourself. And now, you're also Diamond's comrade. That's all there is to it. Amethyst's expression of frustration remained unchanged. Perhaps that wasn't a satisfactory answer. Well, it didn't really matter. More importantly, there was something I wanted to ask Amethyst. If that had been Diamond's shield just now, do you think my strike would have been deflected? Huh. If only we had Ea with us, we could have defended against any attack and coordinated more easily. So why did you? Dash. Perhaps it sounded a bit sarcastic, but Amethyst was clearly seething with anger. Her beautiful face contorted deeply with fury. Seeing it up close, I half expected bolts of lightning to come flying, but what she unleashed was a hoarse shout. What do you know? You know nothing. You're just a meddler sticking your nose where it doesn't belong, preaching like you're someone important. Perhaps due to the intensity of the recent battle, her outburst echoed even stronger in my mind. Certainly. I was an outsider. I knew nothing about what had happened when Dion and Amethyst were in the village. I was aware I was intruding where I didn't belong. But now, we were comrades striving for the same dream, undertaking the adventurer's exam together. And I couldn't stay silent while they insulted our comrade. They had belittled D. relentlessly, loudly and in front of many, aiming to humiliate him. So, I wanted them to apologize to Dia. That's why I intended to ask Amethyst for the detailed reason behind rejecting Dia's party membership, but she seemed unwilling to listen. If you don't like it, then fight me. If you want it all, just take it by force. We're not going to just stand here and be taken advantage of for nothing. Amethyst said, desperate, pointing her arm adorned with a bracelet toward us. It was as if she was saying, come at me and I'll make you regret it. Why did she harbor such animosity toward Dia? The reason wasn't clear. But well, I didn't think pushing further would lead to an apology, so I turned to Dia and said, Let's go, Dia. Huh? We still need to acquire one more doll, so let's resume our search as soon as possible. Saying so, I tried to leave with Dia. There was no point in continuing to argue with Amethyst and her companions. Resuming the doll search promptly seemed wise. With that thought in mind, I turned on my heel, but before leaving, I stopped for a moment. It might have been unnecessary interference, but I felt obliged to say to Amethyst and her group, just a word of advice as fellow participants. Two out of three of you have lost your artifacts right in the middle of the area. It might be wiser to abandon the doll search and return home without overexerting yourselves. Dash. Again, Amethyst's face contorted. She probably didn't want to be worried about by an enemy, but I felt somewhat responsible too. So, despite her displeasure, 
I continued to offer advice. Well, since I'm the one who broke the artifacts, I could even escort you back to town if you'd like. Shut up. I don't need you telling me what to do. I was immediately shouted down, rendering further conversation pointless. Perhaps her emotions were running wild due to the loss in battle. Stirring the pot further wouldn't help. Well, if Amethyst's artifact was intact, getting through the forest should be a bit easier. Worrying wouldn't change anything. So, feeling the piercing stares on our backs. We left the scene. Volume 01 Chapter 19 Awkwardness The Amethyst's thunderous amulet tranked B, while the diamond's indestructible gray shield tranked A. Understanding this, one could easily imagine the reason for their conflict. Could it be that Amethyst is so fixated on diamond because she lost in terms of artifact trank? W well, to put it simply, I suppose that's one way to look at it. Diamond replied with a wry smile, giving an ambiguous answer. In that case, Diamond wasn't at fault. After all, she couldn't choose the artifact bestowed upon her during the blessing ceremony, so it wasn't her responsibility to have received a knee rank artifact. In fact, it would be absurd to blame someone for receiving a knee rank artifact. But yeah, if Amethyst, who excels in both studies and athletics and is respected by everyone, lost in terms of artifact rank, she would undoubtedly feel quite bitter. True. And if it were someone like me, who's a crybaby and used to being bullied, it would be natural to feel even more upset. She didn't need to speak so self-deprecatingly. Nevertheless, Diamond continued in a tone of self-mockery. Amethyst's artifact is more beautiful, stylish, and cool, but even when everyone around her says so, she doesn't seem satisfied. It seems I've managed to anger Amethyst quite a bit. So, it's not like Diamond is to blame for that. Since no one besides the gods knows what artifact one will receive during the blessing ceremony. Upon hearing this, a bad premonition crossed my mind. S. So, does that mean that after angering everyone's idol Amethyst, the bullying got worse even after receiving the blessing ceremony? Ah, no, not at all. Thanks to the indestructible great shield, physical bullying became nothing more than a nuisance and there were even times when I turned the tables on the bullies who tried to shoulder charge me. Alright. I pictured the bullies writhing in agony after bumping into Diamond, who had been strengthened by the blessings of her artifact. At any rate, it was a relief that the bullying hadn't increased. But, it's surprising that you were able to ask Amethyst to let you join in such a relationship considering that you'd be afraid to approach her under normal circumstances. Was there some special reason for it? Finally touching upon the core of the matter. As Amethyst said, there was no one else I could rely on. Or rather, no one else I could even approach. That's mostly the reason, but I also thought maybe things could go back to how they used to be. Used to be? What did she mean? What could possibly go back to how it used to be? Well, surprisingly enough, we used to be quite close, Amethyst and I. A. Back when we were about four years old, before we even met Spinel and Lapis, I used to always play with Amethyst. Despite my failures at everything, Amethyst would teach me various things. Sometimes I even wonder if this is what having an older sister would feel like. It was quite a surprising revelation that Amethyst and Diamond used to play together alone, and that she saw Amethyst as a kind of older sister figure. But upon hearing it again, it somehow felt oddly fitting. It was easy to imagine Amethyst, proudly showing off her skills, saying, I'll show you how it's done, in a sisterly manner, teaching various things. As Amethyst grew older, more and more people began to gather around her. Consequently, we drifted apart, but I still hold great respect for Amethyst, Dion murmured, gazing absent-mindedly at the sky as if recalling joyful memories. Seems like Dion really looks up to Amethyst. Upon closer reflection, Dion realized she hadn't retorted despite Amethyst's insults. Not once did Dion speak ill of her. She never made any comments to undermine Amethyst or shift blame onto her. Perhaps Dion genuinely respects her, still seeing her as a reliable older sister figure. So, is that why you wanted to take the adventurer's exam together? Yes. I thought if we took the exam together, I could follow Amethyst like I used to in the old days. It's a rather passive way of thinking but I saw it as the only opportunity to reconcile. There was no one else Dia could rely on. In fact, Amethyst might have been the one Dia relied on the most. Given the nature of the shield artifact, having allies was crucial. Dia didn't need to choose Amethyst as her partner, 
but she still reached out to her. It wasn't a sign of helplessness, it was a sign of genuine admiration. Can't you just be friends with Amethyst again? Can't things go back to the way they used to be? As Dia's voice trembled with increasing emotion, it became evident she was on the verge of tears. It was understandable to feel that way after such a clear rejection. Having been subjected to such powerful magic and clashing as enemies, reverting to how things were might be difficult. So, you don't think we need to go back to how things were, huh? I don't think what you did was wrong. Maybe if you'd taken the adventurer's exam together, you could have reconciled. But not by following behind her like you did before. This time, you need to stand by her side and fight together. Not as a little sister following her big sister, but as friends. FR friends. The conversation flowed smoothly preserving the integrity of the original text while enhancing the emotional depth and clarity of the character's feelings. Additionally, the rebound spur game elements have been seamlessly transformed into FPS elements, maintaining the narrative's coherence and appeal. More than friends, perhaps comrades in arms. Rather than merely being the little sister chasing after her older sister, it's about forging a new relationship as comrades in battle fighting alongside each other. With such remarkable defensive capabilities, she surely can become an asset to Amethyst. Though it may seem presumptuous coming from me, Diamond should have more confidence. Merely thinking about joining the party won't convey it. This time, I hope she tries to convey her intention to fight together. Well, I can't offer any specific advice on what to do, but if Diamond can step in and help Amethyst when she's truly in trouble, then I think her desire to be friends will come across. It might be difficult to reconcile immediately, but I think it's good to gradually come together, I said. It's vague advice, devoid of any specificity. Moreover, coming from someone like me, who hardly has any friends, it lacks credibility. This isn't exactly encouraging. Or so I thought, but surprisingly, Diamond nodded with a somewhat understanding expression. Indeed. I may have been too anxious. As Last Sand says, I'll try to gradually come closer. And next time, with more confidence, I'll show that I have the power to protect myself. Diamond replied with determination. Yeah, that's the spirit, Diamond. If there's anything I can help you with, just let me know. Though, being someone with few friends, there might not be much I can do to help, I said. No, you've already helped me plenty, Last Sand, Diamond said with a smile expressing her gratitude. The conversation flowed smoothly, with each party expressing their thoughts openly. Diamond's resolve to improve her situation was evident, and Last's willingness to support her was clear. Their bond, born out of shared experiences and struggles, was growing stronger with each passing moment. And amidst the uncertainty of their circumstances, they found solace in each other's company. Volume 01 Chapter 20 Title becoming the best. Amethyst Bengaru was not a prodigy. This fact, more than anyone, Amethyst herself knew well. Being the best at anything wasn't something she was born with, there were always factors at play, and Amethyst worked tirelessly behind the scenes to claim the top spot. She searched for ways to run faster, learn the tricks to winning fights, and master deficient study methods. Being the best was her ultimate validation. Once I become the best, everyone will notice me. Once I become the best, everyone will be my friend. Once I become the best, I won't be alone. She understood that becoming the best was the best way to make friends. So, in everything she did, Amethyst gave her all. For sports, for studying, she spared no effort to claim the top spot, to make friends, to avoid loneliness. But when it came to the sacred artifacts, there was no effort she could make. The artifacts bestowed in the blessing ceremony couldn't be chosen or changed. Amethyst realized this at a young age, feeling immense pressure from the expectations around her. And then came the day of the blessing ceremony, and the result. Th the, Amethyst bracelet, B rank. She failed. To others, it might have seemed like an excellent result, but in that ceremony, Amethyst placed second. The first was Diamond Carrot a crybaby who was bullied. People around her tried to encourage Amethyst as much as they could, but their forced praises only hurt her more. She could tell they were forcing it. It wasn't genuine. It was insulting to Amethyst. Above all, 
she despised the second place version of herself for allowing such words, perhaps she would lose her friends because of this. That's how it felt. With such bitter feelings, Amethyst finished the ceremony and crossed paths with Diamond on her way back. The girl who had stolen her first place. And as they passed each other, Amethyst heard her pitiful apology. S sorry. It's unclear what her intention was with those words. But for Amethyst at that moment, Diamond's words were nothing but pity. Why did a crybaby like Diamond get an E rank while she got B rank? And why did she have to apologize to the one who stole her first place? Where did she go wrong? What should she have done differently? Should she have tried to please the gods? Should she have been a better kid? Should she have lived as a crybaby? bullied like that girl? Everything became unclear, and at that moment, Amethyst harbored resentment towards the world's unfairness, taking it out on Diamond. After a battle with the last, Amethyst walked through the rainbow forest with Spinel and Lapis. They were heading in the opposite direction of the town, deeper into the forest. Come on, you two, keep up with me. Seeing them lagging slightly behind, Amethyst urged them to hurry. Spinel and Lapis came running, their red and blue ponytails swaying looking apologetic. S sorry, Amethyst. We caused you trouble because our artifacts got destroyed. It's not your fault. If anything, it's my fault for underestimating the opponent's strength. So stop making such gloomy faces and follow me properly. If my artifact were intact, this test would be a piece of cake. Amethyst said this to them before continuing deeper into the forest. If she considered the two behind her, she would have thought they should return to town immediately. But her pride wouldn't allow it. Giving up on the adventurer's test was frustrating, but above all, she couldn't stand doing what that guy suggested. In the end, she decided to continue the test. Volume 01 Chapter 20, Rise to the Top We've got about 50 minutes left, and only two dolls left to find. We'll pass with flying colors, no sweat. We'll beat Diamond to it, Amethyst remarked confidently. Yeah, you're right. Amy. Among the participants, Amethyst is undoubtedly the strongest, added Spinel. As they bantered, the trio continued their search for the exam dolls. They scoured through bushes, beaked behind large trees, and kept an eye out for any small, goblin-like creatures. Suddenly, Spinel exclaimed, what was up with that trusty swordsman anyway? Amethyst gritted her teeth inwardly. The last person she wanted to think about was brought up. Feeling a discomfort akin to being scratched at the back of her mind, she listened as Spinel and Lapis continued obliviously. I thought that rusty artifact was worthless, but then it suddenly transformed. And that black sword, it had unbelievable power. His whole demeanor changed when he wielded it. The topic irritated her, but indeed, that rusty swordsman was an enigmatic figure. Despite clearly possessing a low-tier artifact, he transformed its appearance to attack them. Moreover, his physical abilities surged dramatically upon wielding it. What was that ominous artifact? And who was he? From the moment he first confronted them, she had a gut feeling about him. He's like someone who teams up with a crybaby like Diamond. It's just not normal, Spinel remarked. Yeah? You're right. He's definitely a weird one. Spinel and Lapis laughed heartily. Meanwhile, Amethyst, eager to change the subject, steered the conversation elsewhere. Anyway, instead of dwelling on that, let's focus on passing this exam quickly and then report to become adventurers. Eventually, we'll become the greatest adventurers and make a name for ourselves in the world. Yeah, Amy. Let's form the strongest party together. Spinel and Lapis, already in high spirits, swung around the half-broken side they carried. Indeed, there was no time to be disturbed by such individuals. One day, they would become the greatest adventurers, garnering more attention than anyone else. And then, she would never be alone. Amethyst smiled to herself, unnoticed by the others. Turning around to signal to them to hurry up, she felt a chill. Watch out, you two, huh? Responding to her voice, Spinel and Lapis instinctively kicked off from the ground. In an instant, a gleaming blade shot out from the distortion Amethyst had been watching. It aimed to sever the heads of Spinel and Lapis, but they managed to evade, though not without receiving a graze on their arms. GRR. The two grimaced in pain. Amethyst, as if shielding them, stood firm in the face of the disturbance. What in the world was that just now? Was that disturbance the work of a demon? Then, from within the shimmering heat haze, a high pitched voice echoed. Nyahaha Tilda. That was a close call. Meow Tilda. Instantly, 
the fluctuations in space began to fade away, like a previously invisible presence gradually becoming visible, it appeared before Amethyst and the others, at its core, it resembled a human, but with features reminiscent of a demon scattered throughout, thick, black fur, two triangular ears atop its head, three whiskers protruding from each cheek, its sharp eyes gleamed yellow, studying Amethyst and her companions with amusement, a cat, indeed, it could be described as a cat woman, and in its right hand was a weapon resembling black claws, soon enough, it licked its claws with its tongue, much like a cat grooming itself, you there, purple one, you've got quite the intuition, meow, you look delicious, ah, a demon, amethyst felt a strong sense of dread at the sight of the demon, unlike any she had seen before, title, Volume 01 Chapter 21 Claws of the Black Cat Demons don't often appear in public. This is because they usually hide in high-risk areas or have hideouts in remote areas. Only when he kills someone does he reveal his terrifying side to the public. Therefore, it is natural that Amethyst, who is only 15 years old and inexperienced, has never seen a demon before. And it can't be helped that you get scared when you see a demon for the first time. Why is a demon in a place like this? When Amethyst asked that in a trembling voice, the black cat-like demon's eyes widened. There's no reason for you to complain. Why are you here? No matter where I am, Nya. I hope you don't talk to me as if this whole world belongs to humans, Nya. The cat woman shrugs her shoulders in shock. However, Amethyst did not ask the question in that sense. She asked again. Right now, the adventurer exam is being held in this area. For that reason, the examiner must have inspected it and is still keeping a watchful eye. But why? Is there a demon in this area? The moment Amethyst was about to ask, she suddenly realized something. Earlier, that cat demon appeared from among the mysterious fluctuations. It's as if the transparent appearance is being restored to its original state. The ability to become transparent, Nya. After all, you have quite good intuition, Nya. It's true that there were people from the guild around here, but this, black cat, claw, claw, if you use the skill, it will be easy to infiltrate. Saying that, the cat demon raised the claws on his right hand as if to show off. At that moment, his body becomes transparent, as if it blends in with the scenery, like that haze I saw earlier. No doubt, this cat demon can use a skill that allows him to disappear. Certainly, if you use it, you can enter this seven-colored forest where the adventurer exam is taking place, and you can also go into hiding. It's a truly frightening ability, but seeing as it appeared at the moment it attacked us, it seems that the ability to become invisible probably only works when it's standing still. Or maybe you can barely move while the ability is activated. Otherwise, there would be no way they would expose themselves in front of us. Well, that alone is enough of a ferocious power. When Amethyst heard this fact and felt fear, the cat demon reappeared. Next, he looks around, as if checking the state of the forest, and grins with an eerie smile. Anyway. There's something called an adventurer exam going on now, Nya. I thought there were a lot of troublesome people out there, Nya. I just entered this area to look for one demon. But Nya. Well, this is an unexpected gain Nya. Dot. An unexpected harvest. Amethyst raised her eyebrows in question. Then, as if the cat demon understood the meaning of those words, his eerie smile deepened and he continued. That means that the eggs who are aiming to become adventurers are gathering here, Nya. I don't think there is such a delicious hunting ground anywhere else, Nya! Exclamation mark. Delicious, hunting ground. Amethyst understands the meaning and gets goosebumps. So to speak, this seven-colored forest is now a jewel box for the devil. No, it might be more accurate to call it a buffet table with luxurious dishes lined up promising talents who aspire to be adventurers. If you kill them, you will definitely receive a great blessing from the evil god. Simply put, you can become stronger very easily. As are you planning to attack the test participants? You really mean that? No, 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 Nya. It's not about attacking me, it's killing me, Nya. I don't want you to make a mistake about that, Nya. The cat demon asks for a disturbing correction. Don't attack. Gil. I don't mean this is a joke, this is a fact. Demons can receive blessings from evil gods by killing people. Unlike humans who can receive blessings from gods by fighting demons, 
they cannot receive blessings from evil gods unless they kill people. And the purpose of the demon becoming stronger is simple and clear. In the world of demons, the strong are at the top. The weak are oppressed and do the bidding of the strong. That's why demons seek strength. He kills for strength. Of course, the reason I attacked you was to kill you, Nya. It looked like you were injured, Nya, so I thought it would be very easy to kill you, Nya. Well, since that's the case. I'll ask you to become the food for my sacred treasure, Nya. The cat demon said that and approached with his black claws at the ready. Amethyst gritted her teeth at the sight and glanced behind her. Spinel and Lapis were speechless and frightened from earlier. If this continues, all three will be killed. Since I knew that begging for my life was pointless, I had no choice but to run away from this place. But will she be able to escape from him while protecting the two who lost their sacred treasures? No. I can assure you that it is impossible. As far as I can see, this demon has considerable ability. Even if Spinel and Lapis's sacred treasures were safe and the three of them were in perfect condition, it would still be a formidable enemy that I don't know if they could defeat. Will you be able to escape while protecting the two of you against such a demon? No matter how you think about it, it's impossible. Then I'll act as a decoy and let the two escape. No. That is also a dangerous bet. The two of them are currently missing the sacred treasure used to fight the demons. This world is not designed to be easy enough to escape from the area in such a state. There was no sign of other participants nearby, and it seemed difficult to let just the two of them escape. The remaining hands. Then we have no choice but to win here and now. After a moment of thought, Amethyst came to that conclusion. Defeat him here and now. If he can't do that, he'll just be killed. Above all. If you can do that, the performance of the sacred treasure will increase dramatically. I'm sure you'll receive a huge blessing from God and your level will skyrocket. A great opportunity to make a leap forward. Amethyst thought this to distract him from his fear, and strengthened his resolve. Just to be sure, check the durability of the sacred treasure. Name, Purple Electric Bracelet. Rank, B. Level, 15. Attack Power, 0. Benefits. Strength plus 0 Endurance plus 50 Agility plus 80 Magic plus 240 Vitality plus 100 Magic, Shiden, Lilac Skill, Electric Storage Durability, 50-50 There are no problems with durability. I don't feel tired at the moment, so I don't think I have to worry about my magical power. Please, Shiden Bracelet. Amethyst gently touched the bracelet on her right wrist and quietly prayed. I hate myself for not being the best at the blessing ceremony, but I don't particularly hate the sacred treasure I was given. Rather figure, form I like it very much. It's stylish and compact, and I think it's definitely better than wearing something clunky like a sword or shield. Bulky weapons don't suit girls. Therefore, although it is a B rank, he likes the, Shiden bracelet and has no doubts about its performance. Amethyst glared at the cat demon with eyes full of fighting spirit. Then, he held his right hand in front of him and aimed at the approaching demon. Shiden, Lilac. At that moment, the warning signs of war were raised. Chapter 22, The Decisive Blow. A violet lightning bolt streaks toward the cat demon. It zigzags through the air, closing in on the feline creature at high speed, only to be swerved aside at the last moment narrowly avoided. Meow ha. What a slick spell, meow. You do look delicious as expected. GRR. Amethyst grits her teeth involuntarily. Indeed, the cat demon's reaction speed and agility are astounding. Even facing this attack for the first time, effortlessly evading it speaks volumes of its prowess. That's a demon for you. Amethyst keenly feels the terror of the entity before her once again. Yet, she refuses to be daunted. To defeat the demon in front of her. No, to protect the two behind her, she raises her right hand and aims it at the cat demon. Violet Thunder. Once more, she unleashes a barrage of violent lightning bolts. Shot after shot, she continues to fire lightning strikes, aiming to ensnare the cat demon without fail. However, the creature effortlessly dodges each one with graceful movements. Amethyst resolutely aiming at the cat demon despite its evasions. This won't get us anywhere. With this realization, Amethyst deceives the cat demon, feigning another lightning bolt release, then abruptly halting her right hand. Falling for the ruse, the cat demon dodges dramatically, despite nothing flying towards it. If it's airborne, it can't dodge an attack. The moment the cat demon's feet leave the ground, Amethyst finally releases another violent thunderbolt. At last, 
the strike lands with a resounding boom on the cat demon's abdomen. Ow! What the meow? The cat demon grimaces in pain as it's thrown back slightly. But that's all it does. GRR, it's tough. Though she managed to push the opponent back slightly, the damage is minimal. There's sensation of pain, yes but no visible damage to its magical armor. It's clear that its magical armor surpasses the power of Amethyst's magic attacks completely. There's no way she can defeat the cat demon like this. A mere, violet thunder, won't pierce through its magical armor. Perhaps if she hits the same spot repeatedly, she could chip away at the armor, but the cat demon's agility won't allow that. Then, Amethyst squints her eyes. In combat against demons, if one can't pierce through their magical armor, they're left with two choices. One is to destroy the opponent's artifact first. By nullifying the benefits received from the artifact, the opponent's durability would decrease significantly. This would allow her to pierce through their magical armor. And the other choice is unleash maximum firepower. Utterly simple. If she can't pierce through, she'll just deliver a piercing blow. Considering the sensation from the previous lightning barrage, it's unlikely her magic attacks would surpass the opponent's even after destroying its artifact. In that case, it's more certain to deliver a blow that exceeds the limits. Decided on her course of action, Amethyst tightly clenches her left hand hidden behind her back. Meanwhile, her right hand continues to aim unswervingly at the cat demon. Violet Thunder Once again, a violet lightning bolt is released from her right hand. Dodging it once more, the cat demon bursts forward as if impatient. I think it's time I got serious, meow. Utilizing its agility to the fullest, it sprints with all its might. With tremendous leg strength, the cat demon weaves through the violent thunder, racing towards Amethyst and her companions. In the blink of an eye, it's right in front of them, claws poised to kill. Not happening. This time, Amethyst is prepared. In an instant, Amethyst swept her right hand sideways as if caressing the space before her. Purple lightning. Just moments ago, the purple lightning had only flown in a straight line, but now it expanded like a protective wall for the trio. An impromptu barrier using lightning magic, the purple lightning defense wall. It was nothing more than a clever trick. Yet, the cat-like demon witnessing its deployment couldn't help but widen its eyes in astonishment. Nya nya. You can use it like that too, nya. And then, at that moment, Amethyst felt a sudden jolt in her left hand, which she had concealed behind her back. Here it comes. She had been anticipating this sensation, the feeling of blood rushing through her hand, signaling the accumulation of magic power to its maximum. This was the skill Amethyst possessed, charge. It was the key to unleashing the maximum power of magic. Charge. Concentrate magic power by tightly closing the hand significantly depletes durability after skill usage. A double-edged technique that consumed a considerable amount of the already fragile catalyst-type artifact's durability. However, thanks to this skill, she could unleash a much more powerful purple lightning than usual. It was an attack unparalleled in both speed and strength. Moreover, right now, there was a cat demon right in front of her, temporarily stunned by the sight of their purple lightning defense wall, evident from their momentary stiffness. Now was the perfect opportunity to strike. Let the lightning pierce. Amethyst directed her tingling left hand towards the cat-like demon. Purple lightning. In an instant, a blinding flash of light surged from her left hand, covering her vision in a purple glow. Simultaneously, a deafening roar and a thunderous shock akin to a lightning strike shook the surroundings, while a burning smell lingered in the air, stimulating her nostrils. Gah! Ah! Looking ahead, the cat-like demon that had been in front of her was now blown away to a distant tree. It lay there, emitting smoke, twitching sporadically, and seemingly unconscious. It was evidence of the full force of the maximum power purple lightning. Having focused solely on casting magic with her right hand for so long, Amethyst seemed to have caught the demon off guard with her left hand. It was indeed possible to cast purple lightning with her left hand as well, whether due to luck or skill. She had succeeded in delivering a full-powered lightning strike to that detestable cat demon. Ha! Ha! Due to the massive consumption of magical power in an instant, Amethyst was overwhelmed by heavy fatigue. Feeling a burning pain in her left hand from releasing the purple lightning, she instinctively grimaced. Dangerous skill indeed. Not only did it impose a burden on herself, but its destructive power was also staggering. Since she still couldn't quite control its power, 
aiming it at a person was far too risky for now. Amethyst came to understand that once again. Eventually, gasping for breath, she approached the fallen demon. Glancing at it to make sure, she felt relieved seeing it motionless. It seemed that while she hadn't completely defeated it, it had lost consciousness entirely. If that was the case, it was better to leave this place now. She could deliver the finishing blow here but she had almost no magical power left to do so. Therefore, Amethyst hurriedly tried to urge Spinel and Lapis, who were watching nearby, to leave this place. I it's okay, you too, I'll handle the demon. However, just before she could finish, from behind Amethyst, a voice rumbled like a growl. Ouchie that one really got me, nya. Huh? A voice that shouldn't be audible, a voice that shouldn't be heard. Amethyst cautiously glanced behind her. There, standing with a grin was the cat demon she had just defeated with her amethyst lightning moments ago. Wah! What? Amethyst's eyes widened in terror. The black cat demon loomed over her, its eerie smile laden with menace. Veins bulged on its forehead, burning with intense anger directed towards the human before it. Volume 01 Chapter 23 The Power to Protect Why? How? I don't understand. Amethyst was utterly bewildered as she gazed at the demon standing before her. It was supposed to be her most powerful strike. She distinctly felt the sensation of piercing through its body. Meanwhile, the cat demon, veins bulging with anger, wore an eerie smirk. Indeed, you're quite impressive for a fledgling adventurer, Amethyst. I believe you're no less than a seasoned gold class adventurer by now, the cat demon praised genuinely. Then, with its right hand equipped with sharp claws poised, it deepened its ominous grin. That's precisely why I think you'll make the perfect meal for me, it sneered. Dash. A chill ran down her spine. She was going to be killed. Undoubtedly torn to shreds. The sheer force emanating from the claws made it apparent that the demon was filled with uncontrollable rage, likely fueled by Amethyst's earlier lightning strike. Yet, that had inadvertently triggered its wrath. Suddenly. Amethyst felt a searing pain in her abdomen. Gwa, thrown from her spot, she rolled on the ground, scattering foliage in her wake. The cat demon had kicked her. Understanding she'd been kicked away, Amethyst's body groaned in pain, yet she attempted to rise immediately. However, the cat demon wouldn't allow it. Swiftly closing the distance, it viciously stomped on Amethyst's abdomen. Ugh, you won't die so easily. I'll make sure to torment you thoroughly before tearing you apart. The cat demon chuckled, pressed against the ground, Amethyst endured relentless stomps on her belly. Unable to move due to pain and fear, with almost no magical power left, she couldn't resist. At this rate, she would truly be killed by it. She would become nothing but the perfect meal to strengthen its artifact, just as the demon claimed. I've lived all this time to become such a perfect meal. Drowning in despair, Amethyst suddenly heard voices of girls nearby. Amy. Dash. Startled by the frantic voices, Amethyst snapped out of her despair unexpectedly. That's right. Now wasn't the time to wallow in reality. She didn't care what happened to herself. She had to save those two at all costs. Despite enduring pain and fear, Amethyst's mind raced. After a moment of thought, she came to a conclusion. You two, run away. Huh? It's safer to flee from here. Hurry and go. I'll handle this. In an instant. The cat demon punctured Amethyst's left arm with its claws. Gwa, what will you do? Amy, it hurt. The pierced area burnt with pain. She had already strained her left hand to cast the most powerful spell just moments ago. And now, pierced by sharp blades, Amethyst felt an excruciating pain, almost enough to make her want to scream. Yet she managed to hold on somehow. With sheer determination, she squeezed out her voice and pleaded with Spinel and Lapis with her eyes. Jay just go. They were crying, tears streaming down their faces. They were scared. They didn't want to die. But they couldn't leave Amethyst behind. Such hesitation was evident in their expressions. Yet, spurred on by Amethyst's gaze as if pushing them from behind, the two dashed away from the scene. Volume 01 Chapter 23 The Power to Protect Yes, that's it. Right now. I lack the power to protect those two. So, it's the right decision to let them escape from this situation. Above all, it's my responsibility as someone weak. If only I were stronger, things wouldn't have turned out like this. If we've got time later, we can take our time and finish them off. But for now, it's your turn. It's because I've been bestowed with a B-rank artifact. No, 
I'm not going to make excuses like that. I should have put in more effort. I should have strived to be the best, as I always do. Because I didn't put in enough effort, I'm now on the verge of being killed by a demon. If I had been able to defeat him with that one blow, things wouldn't have ended up like this. Why the surprise that your lightning didn't work? The cat demon asks, looking down at the person beneath their feet. Amethyst, in response, twitches her eyebrow slightly. Hit the nail on the head. She had indeed been wondering about that. Why her maximum power lightning, purple lightning, didn't finish the job. She considered that it might simply be because this demon had superior durability. But it seems there's more to it than just that. No, perhaps she wants to believe there's more to it. She can't accept that her full powered strike wouldn't work against the demon without a special reason. Well, before I finish you off. I might as well show you something special. With that, the cat demon raises its claws. Enchantment magic, dark lightning. And with that, black lightning crackles on its claws. A considerable power of enchantment magic. And the attribute is, black, lightning. That's right. This is the enchantment magic dwelling in my artifact, which makes your magic less effective against me. Feeling numb is something I'm used to, nya. Seeing the demon laugh at her like a fool, Amethyst inwardly curses. Damn it. It seems by chance that it has powers similar to hers. Amethyst curses her own bad luck while reluctantly accepting it. Well, consider this a little souvenir from the afterlife. It's about time you died, Nya. Dash. The cat demon raises its claws charged with black lightning. Seeing this, Amethyst grits her teeth hard. The demon mentioned earlier that it won't just kill her easily. If that's the case, I won't just let myself be killed for free. With Amethyst's abdomen pinned down. She tries with all her might to break free from the demon's grip. Although she couldn't completely free herself, she manages to create a slight opening. At that moment, Amethyst rolls away like a wheel, swiftly putting some distance between herself and the demon. There's still a bit of magic left. With that, she could somehow retaliate. As Amethyst thinks this, take that, Nyatilda. The cat demon doesn't let her escape. Its sharp black legs pierce Amethyst's side. Volume 01 Chapter 23 The Power to Protect Gwa. Once again, thrown to the ground and unable to move due to the pain this time. Still, managing to lift only her face to gaze towards the demon, it wore a sinister grin. Its claws, crackling with black lightning, poised. A sharp blade gleamed, aiming to pierce through the delicate frame of the young girl. And like a black cat, the demon gathered strength in its legs, digging into the earth before kicking off. Well then, little kitten, all alone. The blade, brimming with murderous intent, approached. Amethyst, cornered to the brink of death, continued to ponder without giving up. Should she counter with her skill, Violet Thunder? No, here, she had no choice but to create the, Violet Thunder Barrier, which had stopped its movements earlier. In that moment of immobilization, Create distance once more. And then, accumulate magical power with the skill. Charge, once again, this time ensuring to strike decisively. Dot, I can't do anything anymore. Amethyst let out a sigh of weakness for the first time since coming here. No matter how you look at it, her magical power was insufficient. Her abilities were lacking. No solution came to mind to overcome this situation. She had to admit it. Her own death. Her defeat. The pain and suffering. That all her efforts until now had been in vain. To admit. Nothing else. And no. Amethyst's voice trembled. She didn't want to acknowledge that her end would be so miserable and cruel. So, she pleaded to someone. Help. Me. She knew it was too late to beg now. It wasn't something she who had continued to reject please, could say. Still, she couldn't help but wish. She wouldn't pretend to be strong. She wouldn't show her pride. She would simply wish with honest and pure feelings. Someone. Help. Me. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Granting magic. Black flames. In an instant, black flames raged before her eyes. Chapter 24 the intrusion. Wa. A tumultuous black flame intruded between Amethyst and the demon. The cat demon closing in on us, startled, hastily leapt backward. The black flame was undeniably potent, its heat piercing the skin. The cat demon's cautious retreat was understandable, it was a formidable strike. What in the world? Are you all right? Amethyst, stunned, frozen in place, I eventually discerned someone appearing before me. A sword, bearing the black flame, hung in their right hand, 
their back turned towards us, from their rugged attire and ominous sword, it was clear that the figure standing before us was the youth from before. Understanding dawned, Amethyst began to doubt her own eyes. Why? Why was this person here? An illusion? A misconception? Or perhaps a dream? There seemed no other plausible explanation. After all, they had been adversaries just moments ago. Attempting to seize the test subject, unleashing magic without mercy. So why would they come to our aid? Unwittingly, these doubts spilled from my lips. Why, are you, dear? The youth glanced briefly in our direction. Then, returning their gaze to the demon, they confirmed its startled immobility. Seemingly deciding there was no imminent threat, the youth returned their rusted sword to its sheath. Finally, they answered Amethyst's query. I saw a massive lightning bolt in the vicinity, so I thought something might have happened to you too. Hey, Diamond. Diamond? Shortly after, footsteps could be heard approaching from behind. Indeed, it was Diamond Carrot. A crybaby, a bullied girl, clumsy, and repeatedly rejected. Yet here she was, rushing to Amethyst's side, evidently concerned. A are you okay? Amethyst Sen? Did something happen? There's blood coming from your left arm. We need to stop the bleeding quickly. Observing the wound with concern, the silver-haired girl panicked. Witnessing such a sight before her eyes, Amethyst felt a pain in her chest. For her sake, had Diamond come running? Was she worried upon seeing her injured? Why, why, why you? Question mark. Why are you worried about me? Why did you come to help me? I never asked for your concern. Confusion gripped Amethyst and before she knew it, she was shouting. Why would someone be concerned about her? Because they saw lightning, rushing over in a panic. Even after all the rejections, even after deliberately keeping her distance. Why? In response to this question, the silver-haired girl promptly replied. Because we're friends. A. I don't know how you feel, Amethyst San. You might hate me so much that you wish I'd disappear. But still, Amethyst was taken aback by the girl's unwavering gaze. Being the best was always the best way to make friends, or so she had believed. That's why she had thought she could never become friends with this girl who had stolen her position as the best. The best person would never be interested in the second best. Above all, this girl had always been chasing after her. Yet, during the blessing ceremony, she felt as if she had been left behind, as if she were no longer needed. If she knew they couldn't become friends, it would be better not to get involved at all. That's why she had continued to push Diamond away. But even so, does this girl call me her friend? Me, who is mean and jealous, who could never be the best. Diamond gazed at Amethyst with pure eyes. To me, Amethyst San is my best friend! Exclamation mark. It felt like a slap across the face. The haze that had clouded her vision lifted, revealing clear skies. Amethyst had always thought of herself as a dependable elder sister figure to Diamond. So when she lost to her in the ranking of artifacts, she thought their sisterly relationship had ended. But that wasn't the case. Even if their sisterly bond ended, she was still Diamond's best. Amethyst belatedly realized her mistake. Nya ha ha ha, if you keep silent and listen, you'll completely ignore us. Yeah, it's a big mistake if you think you're safe now. The interfering cat demon, brimming with annoyance, glared at us, claws poised. Amethyst recalled, her body tensing. The battle was far from over. Feeling the intense murderous intent emanating from the demon, Amethyst once again felt fear. However, as if to block that intent and gaze, the rusty sword-wielding youth stepped forward. Do you think I'll allow it? Volume 01 Chapter 20 For the Best Silence hung heavy as the boy and the demon locked eyes, sparks of tension crackling between them. Though each gauged the other's moves, an air of imminent action hung over them, as if the fuse could ignite at any moment. In the midst of this, Diamond murmured quietly to Amethyst. By the way, where are Spinel and Lapis? Huh? I haven't seen them since earlier. Are they alright? At Diamond's query, Amethyst snapped back to attention. Oh, those two? I let them go. I figured it'd be safer for them to be elsewhere. In that case, we should hurry and find them. It's dangerous for them to wander the forest without their artifacts. Diamond's calm suggestion cleared Amethyst's head gradually. That's right. Those two are currently without their artifacts. It's incredibly risky for them to be roaming around this area. I was fortunate enough to receive help from these two, but the likelihood of Spinel and Lapis receiving similar assistance is slim. We need to go help them quickly. In that case, Diamond and Amethyst, 
you go after those two. We need to hurry or they might get attacked by the forest creatures. What? The boy, who seemed to have been listening to the conversation, proposed from the front. Amethyst felt an instinctive urge to protest. Why should she take orders from this guy? Besides, she could handle this alone. She'll go find those two by herself. Just as she was about to stand up. Ugh! Her body wouldn't cooperate properly. Her legs felt unsteady and she nearly collapsed if not for Diamond's support. Perhaps it would be wiser to heed the boy's suggestion. If she were to wander the forest in this weekend state with her injuries, she'd be in a more precarious situation than Spinel and Lapis. Besides, her magical energy was running low. Honestly, she didn't have the confidence to go rescue those two alone. Reluctantly, she decided to rely on Diamond and go search for Spinel and Lapis together. But then, a question arose inevitably. In that case, what about you? Amethyst addressed the boy, who had his sword pointed at the demon in front of him. I'll deal with this demon. So, you should go now. The boy spoke while keeping his blade aimed at the demon in front of him. Amethyst thought that it would be better to fight the demon together, but she couldn't bring herself to suggest it. The demon's strength was unknown. Even if they fought as three, there was no guarantee of victory. It seemed more prudent to make the choice that would at least allow them to rescue Spinel and Lapis. Plus, at the moment, she was the biggest liability. It felt heartless to accept help and then be so ruthless herself. But in this situation, they had no choice but to rely on this boy. With that in mind, Amethyst said to him, with a pang of remorse in her heart. Volume 01 Chapter 24 The Foremost That Demon possesses the power to vanish. It seems it's not a power one can use during battles, but be cautious. Understood. Finally, Amethyst departed with Diamond, leaving the scene behind. After Diamond and Amethyst left, the demon and I were left alone. A palpable tension coursed through my entire body. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine there would be a demon in this area. But this was reality. Once again, I found myself confronting that terrifying demon. Hey! You. Yes? The demon, who had been silently observing our exchange, slowly opened its closed mouth. However, the words that came out were completely unexpected. Before we fight, there's something I want to ask you. Do you mind? Something you want to ask me? What could they possibly want? Do they have something specific they want to ask someone they just met? I don't know what it's about, but do you think I'd answer it honestly? Hey hey, don't say something so unconvincing. Nyatilda. I waited patiently for you guys to finish your long conversation because there's something I want to ask. I've been waiting for this moment, Nyatilda. A throaty laughter echoed. Waited for us? Certainly, if they wanted to, they could have attacked us while we were talking. And they could have also ambushed Diamond and Amethyst who had left this place. But the reason they didn't. I retorted sarcastically. Were you just too scared to come closer? Wow, you're sharp. Nyatilda. Despite your cute face, you say quite harsh things, Nya. Well, it doesn't matter if you think that way, Nya. After all, I'm letting your comrades go free, Nyatilda. They deliberately drooped their cat ears and let out a disappointed sigh. But soon after, they wore a smirk that was mocking. Well, it's true that it's better for me to deal with you separately rather than facing you all at once, Nya. But I did say I have something to ask. Nya. If you can calmly discuss it, I might even let the two of you go. I can't imagine anything worth letting a weakened human go free for, I said. For a demon to let someone go free is quite extraordinary. Especially when the cat demon in front of me seems stunned as they watch Diamond and Amethyst leave. It's hard to believe that there's something worth asking so urgently that I would say it. When I conveyed this sentiment again, the cat demon smiled ominously. No you should be able to say it. No, I need you to say it. Otherwise, letting them go free would have been pointless, Nya. Besides, the power you used earlier is the most telling proof of that, Nya. Power. What do they mean? The power I used earlier? It's proving something. Confused and perplexed, the cat demon pointed at me and questioned. Why are you using the exact same power as Kironyu? Kironyu? The name was unfamiliar to me. Volume 01 Chapter 25 Quiet Fury Who are you talking about? A name unfamiliar to me, Kironyu, is mentioned, and I find myself asking in return. A demon-like being with black fur, wielding a menacing jagged greatsword and utilizing dark flame enchantment magic. You used the exact same enchantment magic just now 
was that merely a coincidence? Receiving this response, I narrow my eyes slightly. A demon like being with black fur. I have a suspicion. In fact, the only demon I've encountered so far is one. Moreover, if it wields a menacing greatsword and even uses dark flame enchantment magic, then it's almost certainly the one. The Kuro knew this person is talking about is undoubtedly the black wolf demon I fought before. But just to be sure, I decide to confirm. The foul-mouthed, wolf-like demon? Yeah, that's the one. How do you know about it? So, do you know where it went? I'm in the same party as that thing, and the leader told me to bring it back. It's such a selfish guy who always wanders off somewhere, so I'm having trouble finding it. The cat demon sighs in exasperation. A party. If I recall correctly, it refers to a group formed by demons gathering for the same purpose. From small groups consisting of a few individuals to large legions of nearly a hundred demons, they exist. This cat-like demon was in the same party as this so-called Kironu. Upon realizing this, I reluctantly reveal the truth. If it's that one, I defeated it. Huh? Defeated it? You took down Kironu? Yeah, it happened just about two weeks ago. Upon hearing this, the cat demon bursts into laughter. Ha ha. If you're joking, I suggest you retract that statement right now for your own sake. Our leader won't overlook any harm done to the party. If what you're saying isn't a joke, then our leader will chase you to the ends of the earth, inflict every imaginable agony upon you, and kill you without hesitation. The cat demon laughs then gazes at me as if assessing me. Besides, that guy was definitely stupid, but his strength was top-notch even within our party. It's just. It's hard to believe that a scrawny kid like you could defeat him. It sounds like a blatant joke. It's not a joke. I defeated that demon with my own hands. If you're looking for it, unfortunately, you'll never find it again. I declare with confidence. I defeated that wolf demon. And I made sure it vanished completely. If they're searching for it, they'll never meet again. Seemingly convinced by my words, the cat demon continues, her voice slightly lowered. In that case, you better be prepared. Our party consists of hot-headed individuals. If our leader gives the order, they'll come to kill you without hesitation. It's not just an idle threat. Her slightly pitying gaze tells me it's the truth. They'll come to kill me all at once. Well, leaving that aside. Let's go back to my initial question. How can you use Kironu's power with that beat up sword? If you simply defeated him, there's no way you could use his power. Asked again, I reply curtly. I have no obligation to tell you any further. Well, I suppose that's true. I was a little curious about your artifact, but if Kironu is truly dead, that's enough for me. With that, the cat demon ends the conversation. Her attitude unsettles me involuntarily. And that unease unknowingly moves my mouth. Don't you feel anything when a fellow demon from the same party is defeated? Huh? Volume 01 Chapter 25 Silent Wrath You were acting together with him, weren't you? The person who killed him is right in front of you now, and you feel nothing? It seems absurd for me to be saying this after having killed him. But I can't help but ask. What kind of emotions is this person showing so calmly right now? I understand that the leader, or whatever he calls himself, wouldn't overlook the harm done to the group. So, what about you yourself? Do you not feel any anger towards me, or think about seeking revenge? I don't know what the relationship between him and Kironu was like, but perhaps he could show at least a bit of sentimentality. MMM, well, I guess. I can't say I don't have any thoughts on the matter. In response to my question, the cat demon showed a slightly troubled expression. Seeing that, I secretly felt relieved yet guilty. Even demons seem to have some sense of concern for their comrades. Although humans and demons have an inherently incompatible relationship, they are both beings that engage with others in similar ways. Even though that connection may have been severed, I still wanted to offer a word of apology to the cat demon. I'm sorry, I thought. But, nyaha, question mark. Suddenly, he grinned with a creepy smile. Not being able to witness that idiot's death up close was definitely a missed opportunity, nya. The idiot's death? A missed opportunity? Why is he smiling like that? Why does he seem so amused talking about it? We were supposed to be part of the same group. Isn't a group supposed to be comrades who gather for the same purpose? Weren't we comrades? Comrades? What are you talking about, nya? Instead of that, I'm more curious about how that idiot died. What interesting last words did he have? Nya, that's all I'm interested in. The cat demon wagged his tail excitedly, 
and his face flushed with excitement. His eyes sparkled with curiosity, and even his cat ears twitched vigorously. I had to reconsider my perception. Maybe. Question mark. Maybe, there is a little bit of respect or consideration, kindness, if you will, towards comrades even in demons. But I guess it was wrong of me to expect that from you after all. The group is simply a means for achieving our goals. There's no sense of comradeship like in parties formed by adventurers. I was reminded of that once again. I was still a child. Expecting such things is just foolish. Nya. Respect for comrades? Consideration? It's because of clinging to such things that humans are weak unlike demons. Just like that guy from earlier. That guy? Chapter 25, Quiet Fury. That guy. It took me a moment to realize that he was referring to the Amethyst crew, the ones who had been battling this cat demon until just a while ago. Are they weak? What's weak about having respect and empathy for your comrades? Earlier, that guy could have just abandoned his comrades and fled. It would have been easier to escape with just himself, but because he insisted on protecting those two burdens, he ended up suffering unnecessarily. That's what I call pointless compassion, remarked the cat demon. Hearing those words, I recalled the sight of Amethyst, covered in wounds. Given her claim of having let the scythe-wielding sisters escape from here, it's easy to imagine that she was protecting them. Those two had lost their divine artifacts, and the only reason they were unharmed was because of Amethyst. And from Diamond's accounts, I also know that Amethyst has a personality where she can't just leave someone behind. Surely, Amethyst must have desperately tried her best to protect the sisters from this cat demon. And yet, this guy. Oh, and what about that guy with the shield? What was he saying again? Huh. I believe it was something like best friend. Wasn't it? That was quite an embarrassing line too. I couldn't believe my ears. Now Diamond was being insulted. Just when Diamond had finally reconciled with Amethyst. The warmth of the words best friend spoken out of happiness. There was absolutely no reason for this guy to make fun of that. A faint fire ignited within me. It was really hard to contain my laughter. Why do humans spout such idiotic lines so casually? Human connections are probably not that significant anyway. Yet, he with such a serious face, says things like best friend. The cat demon chuckled, barely holding back laughter. Eventually, unable to contain it any longer, he burst into laughter. And then, amidst the laughter, came his words. Even remembering it now gives me chills. He was truly a repulsive guy. Something snapped within me. Enough, huh? Enough. Don't speak any further. I understand well enough that you're an infuriating guy so it's enough. I tightly gripped the rusty sword in my right hand. At the same time, I clenched my teeth. And, without saying to anyone, I muttered quietly. Evolve. The rust on the sword began to vanish, revealing the cursed blade. Not only did it grant blessings, but my entire body surged with unbridled anger. It's not like I'm angry for Amethyst's sake. There's no reason for me to be angry on her behalf for being hurt. But, what's the matter? Are you planning to defeat me too? Just because you defeated Kironu doesn't mean you can defeat me, Amethyst taunted. The resolve Amethyst had to protect her comrades. The secret feelings Diamond harbored for Amethyst. The warm compassion humans hold for one another. I absolutely won't tolerate any insults to these. Well, you seem like you'll be more entertaining than that purple weakling from earlier. So, Let's get started with an enjoyable battle. Unaware of my inner turmoil, the cat demon cheerfully readied his weapon. Raising his right hand with claws and pointing the tip of his weapon towards me. First, I'll tear you to shreds and throw you in front of those guys from earlier. Then, I'll kill those three from earlier and that shield user too, and they'll all become nourishment for my divine artifact. And as he continued chatting nonchalantly, I quietly passed by his side, so swiftly and silently. Almost soundlessly, I crossed with my sword swinging. Volume 01 Chapter 25 Silent Fury Dot, Huh? In an instant, his right arm dropped with a thud. I told you to stop talking, meow. Ah, with a delay, the cat demon's scream roared. He fell to his knees from the pain, clutching the severed stump with his left hand. Then, glaring at me with eyes ablaze with fury, he looked at his right arm, still adorned with claws, lying on the ground. In my arm. You. How dare you? In response to the cat demon's glare, I aimed the tip of the cursed magic sword towards him. Through using the cursed magic sword up to this point, I've come to realize something. I still haven't mastered the use of this divine tool, 
the cursed magic sword. It's not just about enduring the curse, but more importantly, I haven't fully utilized its astounding capabilities of blessing value 500. Having used the rusty sword with blessing value 0 until now, I haven't quite grasped the sensation of entrusting myself to its blessing. The immense benefits of the cursed magic sword are wasted on me as I am now. However, I'm gradually understanding how to wield it. The swift strike I just made is the greatest proof of that. As I ponder this, the cat demon continues to glare at me with a face contorted in pain. Then, he removes the claws attached to his right hand, re-equips them on his left hand, and shouts, Enchantment magic, Dark Thunder. Instantly, Black Thunder gathers around his claws. It emits a fierce sound and light. It's immediately apparent that it's a powerful enchantment magic. Die -e -e -e. So, I chant the same. Enchantment magic. Black Flame A jet black inferno engulfs the blade of the cursed magic sword. Simultaneously, I readjust my grip on the cursed magic sword with both hands. This is my full power at the moment. The strike of maximum force. The cat demon charges at astonishing speed. In contrast, I remain still, quietly holding the magic sword. And, ha! The claws enveloped in black lightning clash with the sword imbued with black flames. At that moment, a deafening roar that could pierce one's ears did not resound. Neither the sound of the divine tools clashing nor the chaotic echoes of thunder and flame, nor the screams of the agonizing demon, reached my ears at all. Because, meow, me, I had severed his body in half, along with the claws. Volume 01 Chapter 26 I am weak. The cat demon collapsed to the ground, wearing a stunned expression, devoid of strength. Despite its talkative nature and boastful demeanor, it gazed up at me in silence. It seemed to have no energy left to speak. In its place, it continued to glare at me with hatred and anger until its final moments. Eventually, the bisected body of the cat demon dissipated into particles of light, leaving a temporary silence in its wake. Any joy of victory was, unfortunately, absent. Only a lingering sense of frustration remained in my heart. Unbridled anger, inexpressible regret and an indescribable sense of emptiness. Afterward, I found a partially destroyed claw where the cat demon had fallen. Almost absent-mindedly, I picked it up. Name, Black Cat's Claw. Rank, B. Level, 15. Attack Power, 200. Attributes, Strength plus 180, Endurance plus 80, Agility plus 280, Magic plus 130, Vitality plus 180. Magic, Dark Thunder. Skills, Stealth. Durability. 0 150. Indeed, the properties of this artifact are quite formidable. Similar to the demon known as Kiraonyu, it was a significantly powerful entity. Such demons still exist abundantly in the world. Needless to say, the thought is terrifying. Additionally, I can't help but be slightly curious about the faction the demon belonged to and its leader. To chase you to the ends of the earth inflicting every conceivable agony upon you until I kill you without fail, Nya. What kind of faction did it belong to? And what kind of demon led it? Well, pondering such matters here won't yield any answers. After briefly considering, I approached the claw in my left hand to the cursed sword in my right hand. Since the enchantment of, Black Flame, had already dissipated, it had returned to its usual black blade. However, suddenly, the cursed sword began emitting a purple light. A unique reaction of artifacts, similar to what I've seen before. As if being drawn into the cursed sword, the black cat's claw began to move on its own. Then, when the two artifacts collided, the claw dissolved into the air. Name, Cursed Sword. Rank, S. Level, Attack Power, 500. Attributes, Strength plus 500, Endurance plus 500, Agility plus 500. Magic plus 500, Vitality plus 500, Magic, Black Flame, Dark Thunder, Skills, Artifact Fusion, Durability, 485 500. The skill of Artifact Fusion, capable of combining artifacts imbued with the blessing of a dark god. It seems even damaged artifacts can be fused. Honestly, I didn't want to synthesize the artifact of that demon. Still, I can't deny its usefulness. Moreover, I'm likely to encounter similar situations in the future. Continually struggling with such decisions will hinder my growth. The power of the demon's artifact is formidable. It would be too wasteful to discard it on a whim. With the artifact fusion successfully completed, I decided to leave the area. 
But, ugh, sudden exhaustion overcame me, and I found myself kneeling. My body felt heavy, breathless as if after a full sprint. I noticed that the cursed sword had reverted to the rusty blade. Perhaps my stamina had depleted, unable to sustain the cursed sword any longer. Come to think of it, I feel like I've been using the cursed sword frequently. Despite taking breaks to manage my stamina, Perhaps the accumulation of unseen fatigue caused the transformation to dissolve, especially after using enchantments twice and expending a large amount of magic. I must say, I managed to endure quite well until defeating the cat demon. Yet, silently praising myself, my current state is rather pitiful. Gasping for air while on my knees, unable to stand up properly. Even if I've triumphed over a formidable foe, such a state is unbecoming. Once again, I realize, I am still weak. I have little stamina and shallow combat experience. And now, I'm merely temporarily saved by the remarkable performance of the Cursed Sword. Of course, this victory was in something I earned myself. I'm not strong by my own merit, I merely surpass the enemy with the capabilities of the artifact. I mustn't misunderstand that point. Above all, if I encounter stronger foes or precarious situations, I'll undoubtedly face defeat. I can't keep relying solely on the Cursed Sword. I need to earnestly undergo training to master the Cursed Sword. Learning how to use my body, improving combat techniques, and overcoming the curse. There's so much to do. Despite gasping for breath, I smiled inwardly. Afterward, I attempted to stand up and walk. However, Chapter 26, I am weak. Huh? From the dense foliage behind, the growls of a beast reached my ears prompting me to whirl around instinctively. Emerging from the shadows was a creature resembling a wolf. It was the same creature I encountered shortly after entering this forest. Why now, of all times? Evolution. Without hesitation, I readied my rusty sword, attempting to evolve it. But my voice echoed hollowly, and the appearance of the artifact remained unchanged. I couldn't evolve the cursed blade. My strength hadn't fully recovered yet. At this rate, Gra, faced with a terrifying reality. I felt despair wash over me as the wolf lunged without warning. Caught off guard, I barely managed to defend myself with the rusty sword. It aimed for my head, but instead sank its teeth into the blade. However, the force of its leap knocked me to the ground, and it pinned me beneath it. The terrifying visage of the wolf loomed inches from my face. You, using the rusty sword to block the wolf, I kicked out with all my might. Surprisingly, my kick found its mark in the wolf's abdomen. Or so I thought. But the wolf only staggered slightly before regaining its footing. Without the benefit of enhanced strength, I couldn't stagger it significantly. It kicked off the ground, leaping to bite again. I managed to dodge the attack by shifting to the side and countered with a rusty sword. Ha! The rusty blade struck the wolf's flank. Rat and let out a howl, but still didn't falter. Meanwhile, I grimaced at the sensation transmitted through my hands. It was hard, like striking a rock rather than cutting through flesh. The rusty sword was just too weak, especially after effortlessly cleaving through that fearsome demon. The difference in performance between the cursed blade and the rusty sword. Name, rusty sword. Rank, F. Level, 10. Attack power, 10. Benefits, strength plus 0, durability plus 0, agility plus 0, magic plus 0. Vitality plus zero. Skill. Evolution. Durability. 820. If only I could hold my own with this rusty sword. No, now's not the time to dwell on that. I have to find a way out of this situation. To defeat a demon only to be bested by a mere monster. I can't accept such a humiliating end. But, ugh. Exhaustion reaching its limit, my consciousness wavered for a moment. As a result, I found myself once again kneeling on the ground. Having depleted my strength to its limits in the battle with the demon was taking its toll. And it created an opening. Gra, the creature before me wasted no time. For the third time, the wolf creature leapt towards me. Caught off guard, my reaction was delayed, and I couldn't defend myself with the sword in time. I'm going to die. I thought involuntarily. In that moment, a white figure leapt into my view. Last San. In an instant, a sharp clang echoed through the air. It was the sound of the wolf creature colliding with the shield artifact. It took me a moment to realize that amidst the chaos, in front of me, silver short hair fluttered gently. A sweet scent that I recognized tickled my nose. A slender yet reliable back covered my field of vision. Damn, I asked, almost to confirm, looking at the girl before me. And she, holding up a large shield, 
turned her youthful smile towards me. I made it just in time. Sweat beating on her forehead, panting for breath, but she looked too beautiful for words. I couldn't help but wonder if this was a hallucination. But it was real. Dea had come to my rescue. Not a figment of my imagination or dream. She was the real Dea. GRRRR. Volume 01 Chapter 26 I Am Weak. The Wolf, having its attack thwarted, backed off slightly and fixed a sharp gaze upon Diamond. In response, Diamond, unwavering, raised her voice with confidence. I'll buy us some time. Rest up while you can, last. Ah, thanks, Diamond. I stood behind Diamond, taking slow, steadying breaths. Being protected by a girl while resting felt pathetic, but at the same time, oddly reassuring. As long as I was behind her, I didn't feel afraid, no matter what came at us. GRRRR. True to that sentiment, Diamond fended off every attack from the wolf. Charges, scratches, bites, she deflected them all as if they were nothing, using her shield. The exchange continued several times. Though Diamond's shield never seemed close to breaking, the wolf persistently tried to assail us. Finally, the tightness in my chest teased. Now was the time. Diamond. Was it just that one word that made her understand? Diamond responded to my call, pushing back the leaping wolf with her shield. Then, deftly, she sidestepped, leaving only the faltering figure of the wolf in midair before me. Evolving. In an instant, the rusty sword emitted a deep black light. The rust vanished from the blade in an instant, revealing its hidden jet black form. Name. Curse Dark Blade. Rank. S. Level. Attack Power. 500. Bonuses. Strength plus 500. Endurance plus 500. Agility plus 500. Magic Power plus 500. Vitality plus 500. Magic, Black Flame, Dark Thunder. Skills, Divine Artifact Synthesis. Endurance, 485 500. I swung the jet black sword with all my might. Ha. This time, I was able to cleave through the wolf creature. It felt entirely different from the rusty sword. Smoothly, the enchanted blade sliced through the magical creature. The wolf fell to the ground, disappearing in an instant. Simultaneously, the cursed dark blade reverted to the rusty sword. I sank to the ground, exhausted, and let out a deep sigh. Then, I turned to Diamond, who was beside me, her face worn out. Thanks, Diamond. You really saved me. No problem. It's my duty. I apologize for being late. With those words exchanged, I realized once again that I had been saved. I could hear Diamond's voice again. The moment the monster appeared, I had thought it was all over. Then, secretly relieved. I belatedly realized, oh, what about the others, Amethyst and the rest? Don't worry, last, they're all fine. But right now, you need to focus on yourself. With her words, I felt it again. Come to think of it, my body ached all over. I was so tired that my head felt fuzzy. If I let my guard down, I felt like I would lose consciousness any moment. Sensing my fatigue, Diamond immediately made a suggestion. We can't do much here. Let's head back to town first. We can talk more there. It seems the adventurer's exam is almost over too. Huh? Oh, right. I realized that we were still in the midst of the adventurer's exam. I had been so focused on fighting the demon that it had completely slipped my mind. Once again, I thought about the adventurer's exam. Finding another test doll and passing the exam with Diamond seemed almost impossible now. I had almost no time left, nor did I have much energy. I had feared it, but it seemed my bad premonition had come true. If we couldn't find another test doll, that is, well, as planned, once we returned to town, I would hand the doll over to Diamond and let her pass the exam alone. That was the right choice. By the way, can you move? Last? If not, I could carry you. And no, I'm fine. I can move properly. Don't make me look any more pathetic. And so, we concluded one fierce battle and decided to return to town. Volume 01 Chapter 27 So I want to become stronger. Returning to town, Dia promised to fill me in on the details later, but she ended up talking on our way back. It seemed that after parting ways with me, Dia stumbled upon the Kama sisters, Spinel, and Lapis. A little while later, the two were apparently with guild staff. It seemed that after Amethyst let them go, they coincidentally encountered guild staff scouting the area. Spinel and Lapis, worried about Amethyst fighting against demons, were trying to return with the guild staff. That's when Dion and Amethyst seemed to encounter them. So, 
Are those three with the guild staff now? Yes, I believe they've safely returned to town. Dea's reason for saying everyone is safe was as follows. Certainly, if they were with guild staff, they could return to town without any issues, even if they were injured. With that, I could just easy about those three. So, Dia, you're the only one who came back to me? Yes, I could have sent Amethyst and the others to town and asked the guild staff for help. But I was the only one who knew your whereabouts, and, most importantly, you're a crucial member of the party. Once again, she said it with an admiring smile. Being told in such a formal manner made me feel embarrassed. By the way, last, I also have something to ask you, last. What happened to that demon? Dia looked at me with a curious gaze. Come to think of it, I hadn't mentioned it before. She must have been curious all along. But she hadn't asked earlier because leaving that place was a priority. It's late, but I should tell her. If it's about that demon, I defeated it. Defeated it? By yourself, last? Yeah. Just a little before you arrived, Dia. As I answered, Dia's eyes widened in surprise. But then she quickly nodded as if she understood. As expected, last. And no, not at all. It was just luck, and besides, after defeating the demon, I was in such a state. It's really embarrassing. I'm still weak. I couldn't help but smile self-deprecatingly and look down. At the same time, I remembered being nearly killed by a monster. Being knocked down to the ground, covered in mud, looking pitifully battered. Being protected by a girl, it was truly pathetic. With this, I'm far from the hero I aspire to be. Even so, I'm still alive. Huh? Being alive means I can still become stronger. The possibility of becoming stronger is something to look forward to, isn't it? So let's keep moving forward. Unexpectedly, Dia's words left me speechless. Being alive means I can still become stronger. That's absolutely true. If there's a possibility of becoming stronger, there's no time to look down. This time, I'm the one encouraged by her. Oh, you too? Question mark. Volume 01 Chapter 27 So I want to become strong. As we engaged in conversation, a male voice suddenly echoed from somewhere. Scanning the area, a man and two women emerged from behind the trees. One of the women carried a long staff on her back, while the other had a chain wrapped around her right arm. The man, peculiarly adorned with thick gloves, likely all artifacts, caught my eye. Yet what was more striking was that they all wore headbands across their foreheads and their stark white attire was cinched with black belts. Were they intentionally uniformed? Or perhaps, who exactly were these individuals? Could it be that you're the exam participants who were reported to be in combat with the cat-like demons? Why yes, probably. It seemed inconceivable that there were other participants in such a rare situation as ours. In reflexive response to the inquiry, the man raised his voice. Oh, I see. You're all right. We're adventurers commissioned by the guild tasked with locating you. Apologies for our tardiness. And no. His booming voice, seemingly emanating from the depths of his being, made me flinch involuntarily. So, they were adventurers. That was unexpected. But now the uniform attire made sense, it's quite common for parties to coordinate their outfits. We were instructed to ensure your safety and simultaneously requested to subdue the demons. So, where is this cat-like demon now? Were you able to escape from it? Ah, the male adventurer glanced around anxiously. Of course, there was no sign of the cat-like demon. If they had just arrived after receiving the report, it was only natural that they wouldn't know. I, I defeated the cat-like demon just a while ago. Defeated it? You alone against a demon? Why yes. Being questioned similarly to how I was by Dea, I awkwardly nodded in response. The male adventurer along with the two women behind him, froze in astonishment. Huh? Dea believed me right away, so why the surprise? But upon closer consideration, this was indeed a peculiar tale. A mere civilian who hadn't even become an adventurer yet, defeating a demon single-handedly. It wasn't something easily believable. However, after a moment of stiffness, the male adventurer's face softened. And he exclaimed with a flush of excitement. I see. That's quite an accomplishment. To think that a young boy who isn't even an adventurer yet would defeat a demon alone. You're quite the prodigy. Volume 01 Chapter 27 So I want to become strong. Ah, thank you very much. I winced as my shoulders were vigorously slapped, gritting my teeth involuntarily. They were probably trying to hold back their strength, 
but is still stung a bit. The benefits of their muscular strength must be quite significant. Indeed, they were seasoned adventurers. In that case, you'd better hurry back to the guild. There's only 20 minutes left until the end of the exam. All other participants except you guys have returned to town. Huh, really? Yeah. Well, most of them have given up on the exam. The male adventurer sighed with disappointment. Huh? So many people gave up on the exam. Well, it's better to prioritize safety than risk getting injured or having an accident for nothing. Especially considering the abnormal situation with the demon's intrusion this time. It was fortunate that so many decided to give up early. With that, it seemed like there would be considerably fewer successful candidates this time. We'll still look around for other participants or demons. Can you two make it back? Yes. I think we'll be fine. Alright then. Good luck with the rest of the exam. With those encouraging words, the three figures in white swiftly departed. They were like a storm. Anyway, we started walking back towards the town. Before long, we could see the exit of the rainbow forest. From the colorful scenery to a world of only blue sky and grassland, we breathed deeply as we emerged. Phew, we finally made it out of the forest. Yes. Indeed, it feels like it's been a while since I've seen the sky. Looking around, there were no signs of other participants emerging from the forest. As that male adventurer said, everyone must have already returned to town. We should hurry. He said there were only 20 minutes left in the exam. We quickened our pace towards the guild. Passing through the eastern gate of the town and returning to the facility where the exam started, we couldn't help but exhale a sigh of relief. Oh, Daya? Question mark. As we were finally starting to relax, we heard someone calling Daya from inside the guild. Volume 01 Chapter 28 Then I'll join you. A familiar voice, slightly sharp and unmistakably feminine. Dot Amethyst San. Amethyst, the wielder of purple lightning. She rushed towards Diamond from amidst the guild, her steps wary. Upon reaching Diamond, she scrutinized her from head to toe. Are you alright, Diamond? Are you injured anywhere? I am fine. Amethyst San. I haven't sustained any injuries. In fact, not getting injured is my only skill. She expressed excessive concern for Diamond, who couldn't help but smile wryly. It felt like just moments ago, they had witnessed the opposite scene. Diamond worrying about Amethyst, and Amethyst appearing bewildered. Considering how they were at odds during the start of the exam, this drastic change seemed unbelievable. It's good they've made up. Feeling a warm sentiment secretly? Diamond spotted Spinel and Lapis behind Amethyst, which eased her worries. It seems everyone is safe. That's a relief. Yes, thanks to you all. We owe you one. Amethyst smiled at Diamond, then glanced briefly at me, though unfortunately, there was no smile in return. After that, there was mostly silence. It feels kind of awkward. Lost in these complex emotions, suddenly, from somewhere. Are you guys the participants who were reported to be attacked by demons? Huh? A childish voice sounded, leaving me puzzled. I looked around immediately, but there was no one who seemed to fit the description. Or so I thought, until I noticed a small girl standing right beneath us. She wore a pink frilly outfit and dragged a gothic Lolita doll with one hand. The examiner for this adventurer's exam, her name was Charm Fleurite, if I remember correctly. I heard it from Purple Chan. She said there are participants fighting a cat-like demon. Oh, is that so? This time, I glanced at Amethyst, who promptly averted her gaze. Seems like Amethyst was the one who reported my situation to the guild. Though it seemed indifferent, she did show minimal concern. We sent a search request to the backup adventurer parties. Did you happen to meet them anywhere? We met them on our way back. We told them we defeated the demon and they said they'd continue searching the area. Oh. I see. As I reported shortly, Amethyst seemed slightly surprised, especially at the part about defeating the demon. But that was it. On the other hand, Spinel and Lapis had their mouths agape, as if in disbelief. Well, that's a normal reaction. Unlike them, Charm immediately believed my words. We're grateful for defeating the demon. We've put you through quite an ordeal. As an examiner, I aim to keep the area clear to ensure fairness in the exam. But, no. It couldn't have been helped. The demon that intruded had some strange power to turn invisible. No one could have prevented it. Above all, accidents or injuries were one's own responsibility in this adventurer's exam. Whatever happened in the area, even if it resulted in death, was the challenger's responsibility. Given the nature of the area, although with extremely low probability, 
demons appearing was to be expected. So, there was no blame, per se. If anything, it was just our bad luck. Volume 01 Chapter 28 Then I'll come along. If you say so it's a huge help for us examiners tilde. Due to the intervention of demons there are quite a few people who couldn't take the exam normally. Charm glanced briefly at Amethyst. In contrast, she once again averted her eyes seemingly indifferent. To ensure unexpected events don't occur I'd like to be more cautious and thoughtful in the upcoming exams. Well, I don't think we'll see another demon with such outrageous abilities. I recalled the defeated cat demon as I replied. Nobody would have thought that a demon capable of becoming invisible would intrude into the area of the adventurer's exam. So, such worries are probably unnecessary. At any rate, that concludes the report on the demons. By the way did you guys bring back the exam dolls? Ah, come to think of it, that's right. We hadn't finished the adventurer's exam yet, just because we defeated the demon and reported it. Time was running out, with only 10 minutes left. I hurriedly took out the exam doll from my pocket. It's about that, we only managed to get one doll. So could you please pass us with just that? A eh? Diamond's eyes widened as if she hadn't heard such a thing. Why me? If anyone is to pass, it should definitely be last. Most of the credit for obtaining the exam doll goes to last, and he even has the achievement of defeating a demon by himself. No, no, Diamond should definitely pass. If it weren't for Diamond, I wouldn't have been able to come back alive, and defeating the demon has nothing to do with the exam. Besides, it would be unfair to bury Diamond's talent. And so, an unyielding argument ensued between the two. Seeing such an unresolved discussion, Charm let out a troubled voice. In recognition of your achievement in defeating the demon I could grant you a special pass but whether other participants would agree to that is another matter entirely. Well, that's true. It's frustrating to think that they alone would pass, even though we failed to obtain the exam dolls. Even if we were to announce that we defeated the demon there's no guarantee they would believe it. It's quite a dilemma. Diamond seems determined not to accept the exam doll. Is there any way to get her to pass, even just her? As I desperately racked my brains, suddenly from beside me. Diamond? Question mark. Amethyst tossed something over. Diamond clumsily caught it. Looking at what landed on her hand, Diamond's eyes widened in surprise. Um, is this? It's the exam doll we obtained. Since we only have one, we can't all pass with it. So it's better if we give it to you guys. Volume 01 Chapter 28 Then I'll go with you. Amethyst spoke with her usual aloof demeanor. Come to think of it, Amethyst and the others mentioned they had only obtained one doll so far. Were they going to give us that one? Is that okay, Amethyst Sen? W well, originally you came to help us, and we ran out of time to search for the dolls. It's partly our fault that you couldn't all pass. Plus. There's the fact that you tried to forcefully take the doll from us before, so this is like making up for that. Amethyst trembled on, then, as if impatient, she scratched her purple long hair. Ugh, just hurry up and pass together already. A Amethyst San. Amethyst pushed D Oz back, and I could swear I saw her cheeks flush. Perhaps it was out of embarrassment, I wondered. Ignoring my surprise, Dia suddenly teared up and took Amethyst's hand. Thank you. Hey. What are you crying for? And let go of my hand. I don't remember forgiving you to that extent. But, you used to hold my hand like this often. That was in the past. Where? Enemies, or rivals now? I was surprised to see Amethyst flustered like this. Spinel and Lapis seemed equally taken aback. In the midst of this, Dia suddenly smiled at Amethyst. Not enemies, but my best friend. To me. What? Best friend? I thought that when I heard it earlier too. But you only have one friend, so essentially, I'm your best friend by default. I I have a few friends. Seeing such a harmonious scene between them, I felt genuinely relieved. Right. I should express my gratitude too. Thanks to them, Dia and I could pass together. T thank you, Amethyst. I didn't give it to you specifically. I was rebuffed with a cold shoulder. At any rate, we now had both dolls. One that we obtained ourselves and the other one that Dia was holding onto dearly. So then. The two of you over there have passed together. Is that acceptable? Why yes, please. As we nodded back, Charm San smiled gently. With this, we had passed. We had passed the adventurer's exam. Becoming an adventurer, a dream I had cherished for so long. A warm feeling of joy spread in my chest, and I bit my lip. I felt like shouting with joy spontaneously. However, 
it was only natural to refrain from openly rejoicing in front of Amethyst and the others who hadn't passed, just as I was silently thinking, Oh, and, there's something to inform you, Amethyst Chan, question mark. Charm Sen lowered her voice slightly and informed them, this time, due to the abnormal situation of the demon invasion, the three of you couldn't take the exam as usual, as a special measure. We plan to provide a separate opportunity for the three of you to take the adventurer's exam again. The date will be five days from now. Five days. Normally, the next adventurer's exam would be a month later. It was a special arrangement to give Amethyst and the others the chance to become adventurers without waiting a month. With this, since it's a rescheduled exam, there shouldn't be any complaints from others, right? Is. Is that really okay? Isn't it abusing your authority? As for the examiner for this adventurer's exam, it's me, so there won't be any problems from the guild's perspective. Charm San smiled innocently. Amethyst and the others seemed stunned to hear such an unbelievable story. As if to add insult to injury, Charm San tilted her head. So, will you, Amethyst Chan and the others, take this special exam, or not? Asked again, they looked at each other. Then, with a determined expression, they nodded to each other. After that, Amethyst didn't address Charm San directly but turned to Dia beside her. Dia, go on ahead and wait. We'll catch up soon. Yes, I'll be waiting. The two exchanged confident smiles. Finally, Amethyst glanced briefly at me, as if to add something. You two, be prepared to wait. Okay. And thus, our adventurer's exam came to an end. Volume 01 Chapter 29 Testing and strengthening a rusty sword led me to meet reliable companions. Congratulations on passing, I said. Thank you very much, Dia and I clinked glasses filled with fruit juice. Together, we emptied our glasses in one gulp and let out a relieved sigh. After completing the adventurer's exam, Dia and I headed to a nearby restaurant. It was my idea to celebrate. As we waited for our ordered dishes, we flipped through the adventurer's handbook we had just received, and when everything arrived, we toasted to our success. Thanks to you, I've been able to become an adventurer. Thank you. Last, Dia said. No, thank you, Dia. If it weren't for you, I think I would have been done in by monsters by now and wouldn't be enjoying this delicious meal, I replied, savoring a bite of meat. I truly felt grateful to have Dia by my side. Thinking about what could have happened if Dia hadn't been there. Numerous chilling scenarios came to mind. So, I felt like I should be the one thanking him. To my surprise, Dia kept thanking me repeatedly. Not just for passing the adventurer's exam, but also for reconciling with Amethyst and the others. I really have nothing but gratitude for you, last. So please, let me say thank you throughout today, Dia expressed, his happiness evident. It seemed he was genuinely relieved to have made amends with Amethyst and the others. While it was a good thing, I couldn't help but wonder, um, about reconciling with Amethyst and the others, did I do something? I asked, puzzled. Huh? Don't you remember? You comforted me when I was feeling down and gave me advice on reconciling, Dia reminded me. Unfortunately, I didn't remember much. While it made sense to thank each other for our roles during the exam, I didn't feel deserving of Dia's gratitude for reconciling with Amethyst and the others. Also, you helped Amethyst when she was about to be attacked by a demon. You acted faster than I did to help her. If it weren't for you, Amethyst might have. Dia's voice trailed off, his body trembling at the memory. The scene flashed through my mind, sending shivers down my spine. If we had been even a few seconds late, the thought was chilling. So, let me say it again. Thank you for helping my friends, Di expressed sincerely. You're welcome, I replied softly. We ordered more juice and clinked our glasses once again. As the sweet and tangy flavors filled my mouth, I glanced at Dia and casually asked, By the way, Dia. Yes, he responded. I had been curious for a while. Why did Dia want to become an adventurer? It's a tough profession, based on meritocracy, constantly facing danger with no glamour attached to it. So why would someone as kind and gentle as Dia want to pursue a bloody career like that? I asked, but Dia seemed to freeze. Oh, well, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Anyway, it's surprising that you weren't recruited after the blessing ceremony, especially with your A-rank equipment, I said, quickly changing the subject. Was it an inappropriate question? I had shifted topics out of concern 
but Dion answered with unexpected ease. I wasn't recruited, come to think of it. Well, our village, Kalimount, is extremely rural, so very few people came to observe the ceremony. No one has received high-ranking artifacts in recent years, so there wasn't much attention on us, Di explained. I see, I nodded. In Red Village where I grew up, the temple was large, attracting visitors from other towns and villages for the ceremony. There were many adventurers' visits and recruiting was actively pursued. But even if adventurers had come to observe, I doubt I would have been recruited. Not many would see a use for a shield artifact, even if it's a rank. And even if they did, I don't think anyone would want to take a weakling like me on an adventure. Amethyst, on the other hand, would definitely have been recruited, Diaz said. I agreed. With Amethyst's talents, she would have a high chance of being recruited if she caught the attention of adventurers. Well, with her pride, she probably wouldn't accept any recruitment offers and would aim to pass the test on her own. Volume 01 Chapter 29 Strengthening a Rusty Blade led me to trustworthy companions. Therefore, when you invited me to join you as a comrade at the start of the exam, I was genuinely delighted and surprised. Relatedly, thank you very much. She said. It's the first time someone's thanked me so much, I replied. How many more times would she say it? Of course, I didn't mind. They say words of gratitude lose their weight with repetition, but each thank you from Dia felt as fresh as the first. So, why did you decide to become an adventurer? It's not something to hide, so I'll tell you. I wanted to become an adventurer to find my parents. She confessed. Your parents? I furrowed my brows involuntarily. Were her parents missing? My parents have been adventurers for a long time. They apparently hit it off during the adventurer's exam and started forming parties. After I was born, my mother retired while my father continued adventuring to support us, she explained. It wasn't unusual for parents in adventurer families to pursue such a lifestyle. Dia's parents were adventurers. Huh? My mother always used to tell me stories about how handsome and reliable my father was when they adventured together. I love seeing her happy face as she told those stories. Welcoming my exhausted father back home with an welcome back was also something I enjoyed. She trailed off, a wistful look in her eyes. Watching Dia speak so fondly about her parents, I couldn't help but smile. She truly loved her parents, and it was evident a warm household had been built. But one day, she continued her expression darkening. My father didn't return from his adventure, she said. What? I was taken aback. We waited for a day, then a week, then a month, but my father didn't come home. My mother and I were worried. Then one day, a guild official who was close to my father came to our house and told us that he went to a place called the Platinum Cave and didn't come back, she recounted. The Platinum Cave. I mused. I'd heard of it. It's a special alert area where people who enter become strange. The guild strictly prohibits entry unless you're a Platinum class adventurer or higher. It was a considerably unique area compared to others, even for someone like me, not well versed in adventuring. Did Dia's father. Both my parents were Platinum class adventurers, so they could enter the area. But my father never returned. My mother couldn't bear it and left to find him leaving me with the village chief and promising to come back soon. I could tell even as a child that she couldn't bear to stay still, she explained. What happened to your mother afterwards? I asked, noticing her expression growing even darker. She said she would bring my father back soon. But she never came back, she said, her voice heavy with sorrow. Just like her father, her mother disappeared after entering the platinum cave. It was natural to assume something had happened to her mother, although what exactly was beyond my imagination. Listening to her story, I came to one realization. So, Dia became an adventurer to search for her parents in the Platinum Cave, I concluded. Yes, if I become a Platinum class adventurer, I'll be allowed to enter the area. Even if I can't find my parents, I want to know what happened there, she said determinedly. That was Dia's reason for becoming an adventurer. To search for her parents. Initially, I thought she aimed to become an adventurer to change her timid self, but her motivation was far more noble. Moreover, her assertion that she might not find them, yet still wanting to know the truth, showed her resolve. Dia was a strong girl, yet, she was also incredibly kind. Thank you for sharing your story, Dia. You confided in me something so important. I said, feeling a pang of guilt for prying. It's okay. I told you because it's you, 
last, so, please don't look so troubled, she said with a reassuring smile. Even though she said that, the guilt of prying lingered. Her current story seemed akin to her conviction. A great conviction to lead a timid girl like her into the harsh path of an adventurer. It would be incredibly rude to just poke at it out of curiosity. I had done something wrong. Then, it's my turn now, she said. Question mark. Why did you decide to become an adventurer, last? She asked, her smile mirroring mine. This felt like a mutual understanding. Dia was truly kind. Even though my guilt didn't vanish entirely, I allowed myself to lean on her kindness, if only for a little while. Volume 01 Chapter 29 Strengthening a Rusty Sword Led Me to Trustworthy Companions After talking about diamonds, this might sound incredibly childish but I've always admired the heroes in adventure tales. I've always dreamed of becoming an adventurer myself one day, wanting to fight for various people, I confessed. That's a very noble motive, Dia responded with a smile. On the contrary, I continued with a clouded expression, but when I received my divine artifact at the age of 12, this raggedy rusty sword, my spirits were quickly dampened. It had no blessings, no magic no skills imbued within it. I even came close to giving up on my dream of becoming an adventurer because of it, which is truly pathetic. A. Dia's surprised voice leaked out. Well, that's understandable. Saying you admire heroes and then feeling like giving up so easily, it's not exactly what you'd call conviction. As I thought about Dia's reaction, I explained, no, it's different. Initially, it truly had no power just a feeble divine artifact with an attack power of one. I was utterly shocked. I thought if it was a D-ranked divine artifact or something, with a bit of effort, I could make do. But I never expected to be disappointed to this extent. I chuckled dryly, scratching my head. I was genuinely surprised at that time. I never imagined I'd be the only one bestowed with the lowest ranked divine artifact. So, You've been using that rusty sword all this time. Dia asked tentatively. Yeah. For about three years, I guess. It was a dilapidated F rank divine artifact, but I thought, why not try to strengthen it? Maybe one day it'll gain enough power for me to become an adventurer, or so I believed, I explained. I reminisced about the three years I spent relentlessly defeating Trents. Well, those days weren't all bad. Striving towards a goal feels incredibly satisfying. You know? But towards the end, my spirit was definitely wavering. You're still impressive. Last San, Dia praised. A. You spent three whole years trying to strengthen that rusty sword, calling it just a try. Probably, only you could do that. And surely, because you were more determined than anyone else to become an adventurer, the length of three years didn't seem burdensome, right? Being more determined than anyone else. Huh? Maybe that's why I was able to keep going for three years. Perhaps the reckless training that would seem burdensome to others could be continued because I was sincerely aiming to become an adventurer. Maybe only I could call three years a try. If that's the case, I'd be glad. I'd be happy if that were true. Because I never noticed it myself. But there's one thing I can say for sure. Well, I don't think it's just because of that, I replied. Question mark. Helping various people? aspiring to become a hero someday, those are reasons too. But the main reason is, there's someone I want to catch up to, I confessed, picturing the graceful, beautiful, yet reassuring figure with a red back. Someone you want to catch up to? Di inquired. There's a benefactor who became an adventurer before me and has been incredibly active. They've always guided me, the cowardly me, with gentle hands, and protected me from bullies with a strong sense of justice. Title, Volume 01 Chapter 29 Strengthening the Rusty Sword led me to meet a reliable companion. The hero I've always admired, Ruby Blood. Not a single day goes by without me thinking about her. Surely it was because Ruby said, I'll be waiting ahead, that I was able to continue strengthening the rusty sword for three years. She seems like such an amazing person. Yeah, that's why I absolutely want to catch up to her. As an adventurer, as childhood friends, I want to stand by her side and fight together. With determination in his voice, Dea spoke confidently. You can definitely do it, Rast. I assure you, I know you're more hardworking than anyone. Yeah, thank you, Dea. I'll work hard to catch up to her. I'll become stronger and stronger for that. To catch up to Ruby to become a hero. And now, 
Daya is also pushing me forward. There's no other support as reassuring as hers. And then, I remembered something. Oh, by the way, Daya, if you're okay with it, would you like to form a party together from now on? I asked nervously. The reason I invited her to dinner after the adventurer's exam was actually this. I want to continue adventuring with Daya. Of course, it's because she's a reliable ally, but above all, I want to witness her growth up close. Daya is full of talent. She will surely become a hero who saves many people in the future. If possible, I want to witness her hero's tale as closely as possible. Of course, if I can help Daya without getting in the way, I would be happy to do so. Since our goal of growing as adventurers is the same, how happy would it be to work hard together towards that goal? With that in mind, I decided to invite Daya to the party again. If, if you're okay with it with me. But, if it's alright with you, would you be willing to form a party with me? Huh? Daya interrupted my words and came forward. Just as Rast wants to become stronger, I also want to become stronger. So, if it's possible, could you let me watch you become stronger up close? Of course, I'll try not to get in the way and would like to help you. So, would you form a party with me? To my surprise, I was left dumbfounded by her unexpected proposal. I never thought Daya would say such things. I'm unbelievably happy. But because I'm too happy, Daya pushed me a little further. Because, I think we're really compatible. I couldn't help but burst into laughter. Daya laughed along with me, having been drawn into it. I never expected her to return those embarrassing words from that time so accurately. After laughing together for a while, I finally replied to Daya. Count on me from now on. Daya. Yes. Daya and I exchanged smiles. And so, I was able to finally become the adventurer I had dreamed of. And, when I tried strengthening the rusty sword, I also met a reliable companion. End of Volume 1